frame rater. Prior to the unveiling of Serious Sam 3, fans of the series were in a bit of a drought. Serious Sam 2 released in 2005, with HD remakes of the original game popping up in 2009. Between that time, there was absolutely nothing. I remember back then thinking that this series had gone the way of blood. There are rumors about what may have been the problem at the time. Crow Team would need to, hypothetically, acquire their rights back to the series in order to keep making Sam games after having the property licensed to 2K Games. The reason they licensed their property out was to establish a larger budget to put towards the development of Serious Sam 2. We don't know much about this licensing dilemma or what's exactly true in the first place. The conflict has been largely accepted but seems to rely more on rumors than facts. It's a likely scenario, and if this is indeed the case, those involved are probably hesitant to confirm these details for legal reasons. We might never know what happened here without a sliver of skepticism. Another point of uncertainty is what role 2K Games played in the development of that game. It's been said that the company pushed for the cartoony experience we ended up with, but maybe that was Crow Team's own ambition. You'll get different answers depending on who you're asking. What I believe is that they both liked the idea mutually and collaborated on this inspiration. Serious Sam 2's aesthetics felt alienating to some, and to others it was a welcoming new atmosphere. What cannot be denied though is that the game was a misstep. A sequel shouldn't be created with the intention of polarizing a chunk of the audience. This reaction surely wasn't what Crow Team had in mind. Since then, Crow Team has made official that Serious Sam 2 is now considered a spin-off, and should not be considered a part of the story's canon. Even though, with the alternate timeline theory that was introduced in Serious Sam 4, I don't know what would make this game any less official than any other game, for that matter. But anyways, for me personally, it's not the aesthetics of Serious Sam 2 that were the problem. This game feels bloated with content, which is ironically not a good thing in this case. Diversifying the roster of enemies with wildly different damage values makes creating a formula for their takedown a much longer process. By the time you're familiar with them, you're tossed into one of the game's other worlds, and now you've got to relearn the flow all over again with a new set of enemies. I guess that wouldn't be the biggest problem so long as the combat was satisfying enough, and to be frank with you, it just isn't. Despite there's gore flying all over the place, the bright, poofy blood textures make it feel more kid-friendly. On top of that, the game's sound effects would make you believe everything's made of plush animal stuffing. And let me reiterate, this doesn't have to do with the game's tone or atmosphere. It purely has to do with the combat. Every time I go back to this game, I really want to like it, but it's these few things that may not sound like much, but unfortunately in practice, it really hurts the feel of the game. Serious Sam games released prior to this would feature a repetitive set of enemies and weaponry that seems to bore half the people who play it. The other half become familiar with this and attribute what they've learned to each combat situation. It's an addictive formula, and I feel those who truly understand it are what make up the enthusiastic side of the fandom. In remaking the classic games to HD, Crow Team refamiliarized themselves with this formula. It would create the foundation for what is Serious Sam 3's formula. Those familiar with Serious Sam 3, however, may find this to be a ludicrous statement. What may be more appropriate is to say that Serious Sam 3's formula is far closer to the classics than Serious Sam 2 ever was. Sure, there would be modern mechanics such as sprinting, aiming down the sights, reloading. Take that out of the picture, give or take some modern environments, and you've got a largely classic experience. You're never actually required to use most of the modern mechanics anyways, as the only one necessary for the player's progression would be reloading. This did exist prior to Serious Sam 3, albeit for just one weapon, the Colts. If you want to experience the game in a more classic fashion, there's a modification known as Serious Sam 3 BFE Devolved. I don't like it much for preferential reasons, but hey, it's an alternative. Today, Serious Sam 3 has turned 10 years old. What has Crow Team done to celebrate this anniversary? I don't know, I'm not a time traveler, but Sam is, and that's how Serious Sam 3 BFE fits into the picture, being set before the events of the first game, First Encounter. Taking place before BFE would be Serious Sam 4, which I've already done a feature video on, so check that out if you haven't, or don't. I mean, after all, we had to wait 10 years for this, so clearly there's no rush. Despite being the best-selling game in the franchise and returning to a more classic formula, Serious Sam 3 still managed to be considered a controversial game in the community. While saying that, however, I must acknowledge how most Serious Sam games are controversial in the community. Each new release since Serious Sam 2 has been labeled as an identity swap, so by this point it's likely that every fan has felt polarized by Serious Sam before. When it comes to an identity crisis, though, no game in the franchise suffers more than Serious Sam 3 BFE. But this does not necessarily reflect a bad game. The determining factor should be based on the quality of the finished product. There's a lot to go over before that discussion. 
So you might be asking, why was Serious Sam 3 BFE clearly inspired by modern military shooters? I've created a video in the past going over this in detail, called Days of Doom, so if you feel further elaboration is necessary, you can find the information there. If you haven't seen that, or forget about my brief mention in Serious Sam 4's feature video, I'll give you a summary. Crow Team was considered to assist in an id Software Doom project. Around the same time, they'd be developing some military shooter with Atari and a short-lived media group known as Gamecock. Both of these projects would end up cancelled, so Crow Team ended up with a bunch of resources and no project to use them for. Crow Team doesn't like to waste their hard work, and since they no longer have the bigger budget from a company like 2K Games, it made sense to be conservative with the time and money that was put into their unreleased projects. As such, Serious Sam 3 Before First Encounter would be partially focused in these environments, and feature a cast of enemies that wouldn't look too out of place in a Doom game. Oh, what's that? Crow Team says BFE stands for Bumfuck Egypt? Yeah? Great. Well, it's more like a double meaning, if anything. It does take place before the first encounter, and their use of these acronyms in previous cases is extremely similar, so... One can't be faulted for thinking it does stand for before first encounter, and knowing Crow Team, bumfuck Egypt might just be another way of them toying with us. Nonetheless, Serious Sam 3 focused on the disastrous series of events taking place before Sam jumps into what is called the Time Lock, which is a time machine located in Egypt. He will do this in hopes to stop Mental before he makes his way to Earth. I don't mean to spoil the game, but since everyone knows that in the first encounter Sam comes out of the Time Lock, we already know that Sam will end up back in Ancient Egypt, and the remainder of that story will hold out for the eventual Serious Sam 1 feature video. With this all in consideration, the devastation that takes place on Earth, resembling a modern military environment, makes a lot of sense for the game's design. Still, one may ponder what Serious Sam 3 would look like if their earlier failed assignments didn't exist. But to counteract that point, some very early screenshots imply that this military focus was their idea from Serious Sam 3's very conception. This famous screenshot was put together sometime around 2006, using an environment from their cancelled military shooter game with modified Serious Sam 2 assets. At the time, you could ponder whether the screenshot was another one of Crow Team's weird jokes, but in what was perhaps an ironic and unintended twist of fate, it turned out to be a proper reflection of what ended up happening. Nobody could really predict what Serious Sam 3 was going to look like after seeing one potentially joking screenshot. Today, we're more familiar with Crow Team trying to fit into whatever's popular, but back then it was anyone's guess. I don't think many were expecting what we ended up with, though. With the confusions behind this game's development, a theory I've more recently come up with is that the failed assignments were actually using assets made for Serious Sam 3, rather than the more common theory that it was the other way around. I know, this screams the Talus Principle all over it. This could be something that Crow Team unashamedly does now, and this is just the first example of it. Or maybe they liked the outcome of Serious Sam 3 so much that they continued asset swapping, and figured it wasn't a big deal. Whether it is or not is up to your own interpretation, but the Talus Principle becoming as popular as it did gave those assets less of an excuse to be reused in Serious Sam 4 where everyone would notice. Then we, for the Serious Sam 3, there was one project in the meantime which caused us to downsize again. And for the Series Sam 3, it was like, again, less than 15 people. Wow. 15 people, huh? Well, let's see what 15 people could pull off in 2011. Here's Serious Sam 3 BFE. In Fusion, by the way. This is Fusion build, everybody. Fusion video. <laughs> Gonna have to explain this every time, aren't I? Alright, I'll be short. The easiest comparison I can make is that it's like a source port. In 2017, Crow Team released a solo executable that combined Serious Sam HD's first and second encounters with Serious Sam 3. These were, at the time, all the lore-confirmed games in the timeline, with the exception of the VR-exclusive game The Last Hope. And yeah, there's more to say about Fusion, but this video isn't about that. Check out the VR portion of my The Many Releases of Serious Sam video for more. Right, so without further ado, this is Serious Sam 3 BFE. When we last saw Sam, he and his team were in Russia. They completed their mission by destroying the Tunguska portal from which Mental's hordes were being deployed. This was a milestone in the war, but they've got plenty more ground to cover. Serious Sam 3 brings us to Egypt. The mere existence of Mental's war with mankind roots from an accidental discovery humans made sometime around 2063 while desperately attempting to find more usable resources for human need. Here, they discover traces of intervention from a long-extinct species known as the Syrians. When excavating the area of interest, they find hidden technologies that they invented. Humans then utilize these remarkable resources for the creation of interstellar spaceships. They'd be used to explore planets throughout the galaxy. 
Their efforts, more specifically Captain Sam's, unfortunately got the attention of Ta'um, the notorious Lord Mental. Mental's armies would then drive humanity back to Earth, where a new invasion on humankind would begin. Recently, a professor known as Stein had returned to Egypt to do further research on this technology. Perhaps the same technologies that started this expansion could be used to stop it, or to be more specific, prevent it? There exists a specific site at the Temple of Queen Achepsit, where a hypothetical time machine was discovered. With Stein's research, he believes he's finally established a set of instructions for powering on this mysterious machine. The machine's name is the Time Lock. It could be used just once to send someone or something back in time. When the Syrians originally discovered this artifact in their travels, they knew it needed to be kept out of the hands of Mental, so they hid it along with other technologies on Earth. Earth was a place that at the time the Syrians had only just discovered, but they knew that Mental didn't know about it and probably wouldn't for many years to come. Now, let me take this moment to address a potential flaw in my last Serious Sam feature video. I said that the Syrians were probably not as smart as humans since they were eventually captured and repurposed in Mental's army as the beheaded characters you fight. It remains possible that they were less intelligent, but with the lore expanded on in Serious Sam 3, it's less likely. Lord Ackermann himself in Serious Sam 4 says that countless species more intelligent than humans were conquered before Mental had discovered them. And at least one of those species he's talking about is probably the Syrians. Anyways, Syrians brought the Time Lock over to the Atchepsa Temple in Egypt. At least, that's where one of the Time Locks is located. There's actually several, but that branch of the story extends into the classic Serious Sam first and second encounters. Don't worry, Frame Raiders, we'll feature it someday. The EDF, for some undisclosed reason, believe the Time Lock will bring them to a point in history that'll give them an advantage in the elimination of Mental. Unfortunately, at this time, nobody's sure how to activate the Time Lock. Professor Stein's recent discoveries might hold the clues they need. Here is where Sirius Sam 3 begins, in the year 2113. The EDF's Bravo team was sent out to keep Professor Stein safe from Mental's hordes. I'm not sure why Stein didn't travel to Egypt with a team in the first place, but maybe he wasn't authorized to go there. Just in case you're wondering, Stein is not the same professor from Sirius Sam 4. That would be Kiesel. He mentioned Stein a couple times during that game. For whatever reason, Kiesel is not present in Sirius Sam 3. Bravo team lost contact with HQ while looking for Stein, so now Sam and his team have been sent out to investigate. Hopefully they'll locate the Bravo team, then escort them to the museum where Stein is located. Mental wants to fry the Earth and we're protecting a museum? Not really. You're protecting Professor Stein, if anything. With the reintroduction of Rodriguez at this moment, I must reflect on how different he both looks and sounds now. Could never understand what Crow Team was thinking when they recast and largely changed this guy up for Serious Sam 4. Granted, everyone in comparison between the two games is far more serious. While the name Serious Sam may sound like a parody title, the original intention from Crow Team was indeed to make a series that was kinda serious. The original alpha build of Serious Sam gives a better representation of this. Although even then it was much sillier than other FPS games like, for example, Quake. Nonetheless, Serious Sam 3 was Crow Team's way of returning to this original concept of theirs. Need any further proof than them having it take place in Egypt again? Make no mistake though, this ain't no reboot. The established lore places Sirius Sam 3 immediately before the events that are about to unfold. The start of Sam's new adventure begins in Cairo, Egypt. This guy thinks he can figure out how to power up the time lock. Bullshit. Research don't kill aliens. Big guns do. This is Jones, and unfortunately this Devastator weapon has been attached to his left hand since he was a child. It was a terrible accident. Whatever. We get in there, we recon Bravo, we go home. Let's hope they can read a map. Welcome to the destroyed city streets of Cairo. Move ahead to encounter this Ganar. Here you'll only be encountering the female gender of the species. Mental's hordes tend to take on a different appearance around the world. They were probably adjusted in Mental's biolabs for environmental conditioning. This is the form that they take on in Egypt. They looked a little different in pre-release. I think I've referred to these models before as cafeteria slop lunch monsters. Still a fitting name, I think. As Sam knows, the best way to take down a Gunnar is by incapacitating the eye. Without a weapon on hand, he resorts to hands-on melee combat. No skill points required this time. I guess Sam's already been made capable with his skills from Serious Sam 4. When engaged in close combat with smaller enemy types, Sam can perform these attacks by pressing the E key. After which, the player is rewarded with a quote-unquote trophy. 
You can throw it by clicking the left mouse, or drop it quickly by clicking the right mouse. It never serves a definite purpose, though you can stun some enemies for a few seconds by throwing these at them. There is one secret in the game that you can activate with this, which takes place right here. Throw the Gunnar's eye over to the building with a small green light visible. A secret 12 gauge pump action shotgun will be tossed over for the player to use early. This shotgun requires reloading after 15 shots, but otherwise works largely the same to its serious Sam 4 and classic counterparts. Man, how awesome is Natrixa in Serious Sam 3? This presentation rocks! It gives us a great look at the shotgun's totally pointless shell holster. The description says the weapon can only hold up to 10 shots. That's a leftover from the original Serious Sam 3 pre-fusion. So yes, various clip sizes have been increased for the fusion build. Keep in mind, a lot of these changes were highly requested by fans, and with the changes implemented I can say it certainly improves the experience. Crow Team really should have fixed this Natrixa inconsistency long ago, but today we have far less hope for them fixing something small like this. God, please! Oh, a couple weapons also had their sounds changed for fusion. The shotgun is one of those. Here's how it sounded before. And here's how it sounds now. Inside a nearby building, you'll find the first weapon of the game, a sledgehammer. Give me some skulls and one of these, and it's a party. Alternatively, you could jump over to find this secret sledgehammer on the roof of this building. I have absolutely no idea why you would go for this. The sledgehammer is a satisfyingly brutal weapon. When an enemy is close by, Sam raises it in preparation for attack. If no enemy is nearby, the animation takes longer to initiate. You can click the left mouse button to slam it forward, the right mouse button to swing it sideways, and hit the reload key to do a full spin, harming any enemies that directly surround you. The primary and secondary fire modes are equally as damaging. Primary has a set of specific jibbing models for smaller enemies. Secondary completely jibs them as per usual. The spin works much like the secondary, however it has a longer animation that you cannot cancel. Being surrounded by enemies like this is pretty much a death sentence, unless you've entered a situation specifically for using this weapon. Even then, you're usually better off tackling them with a firearm instead. Stone, it's Quinn. We picked up a mayday from Miller. Give me a sit rep. The chopper's Fubart. I ended up a few blocks away. I'm gonna rendezvous Alpha now. Stone, how many times do I have to tell you to wear your seatbelt? Eat me, Rodriguez. What's your 20? We're in front of the museum. You know, where we're supposed to be? Where the hell are you? Stay put. I'm on my way. Roger that. While Sam explores this building, and some mysterious credits pass by his augmented vision, he finds a door that should easily be taken down with a sledgehammer. Break it open to find some ammo, a deceased soldier, and a bizarre stack of clearheads. It's called symbolism. By the way, I've already introduced these characters in the last feature video on Serious Sam 4, so in order to not be redundant, I'll only specify their differences in this game, if any exist. All enemies exclusive to this game, however, I will properly introduce. Down the building, there's a similar door which you can once again break down. Inside, there's a gate protecting an area with a rocket launcher. Of course, you know I gotta get this. Outside of the building, in a nearby dumpster, you can find the keys, indicated by a glowing purple light. Come back inside to collect your secret rocket launcher. Concept art for this thing made it look similar to the original Unreal Tournament rocket launcher, and while I love the look of that, I must say I am fond of the final design as well. What are you looking at? Here's some Arabic writing, which Sam's implemented in Atrixa lets him translate by looking directly at it when nearby. This writing supposedly says, no cover, all man. My friend knows Arabic and told me that the more accurate translation here is, without protection, force only. By the way, no cover, all man was Serious Sam 3's marketing tag that they used throughout the game's promotion. The idea was that Serious Sam 3 returned to old school roots by having no forms of cover, as is familiar to the modern shooter scheme. However, Serious Sam 3 has tons of cover. And I think it'd be pretty unrealistic to say that any shooter that's ever come out has no cover. What, so you're an endless bullet sponge? You're God himself? Hiding momentarily behind buildings is required sometimes to avoid hit scanners like arachnoids, for example. Running towards them is just gonna get you killed no matter what technique you use. So while the comment is a bit misleading, as a marketing ploy it works just fine. I do think it's smart, especially since the old school genre was pretty much dead in this generation. To the left is a Gunnar who's a bit impatient to get killed. There's also some propaganda posters that are used to persuade people into joining the forces of Mental. There are no Harvester drones or Leviathans in Serious Sam 3. Those so far have only been used in Sam 4. The game doesn't tell you how volunteers are being picked up this time. 
These can be translated, but don't be mistaken into thinking everything gets translated, only specific things the developers cared for you to see. Much better! Yeah, well, we'll see how long that lasts for. Yes. The answer is yes. Stone, come in, where are you? Rodriguez, I told you, I'll be there in a minute. It's Jones! Rodriguez took- Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, shit! In pre-release, this exchange of dialogue was longer. Rodriguez took one in the chest. Stone, come in, where are you? Rodriguez, I told you, I'll be there in a minute. It's Jones! Rodriguez took one in the chest. Bleeding pretty bad. Where the hell are you? Just stay calm. I'm on my way and HQ will send a- Oh, shit! By what exactly, who knows. Nonetheless, a bit of an anticlimactic fate for our friend, especially after mourning the loss of Jones' brother in the last game where his death was almost unspeakable to him. I always figured I'd go first. The heart attack while doing blow or in some dumb way like a, a helicopter crash or falling off a horse. Not in battle, obviously. I'm fucking Rodriguez, but Jones, man, I thought he might make it. Go back to being a cook. Open up a taqueria or something. Not... Not this. I think getting bit apart by a knoom is a more respectable loss than, well, taking one in the chest. Rodriguez the Ram. He took one in the chest. Here's a beheaded Syrian. There's only one type in this game, the purple-shirted Rocketeer. Their purpose in battle is identical to that in Sirius Sam 4. By performing a melee attack, you can rip their freaking heart out. Yeah, rip your heart out, Sam 4. This is what a proper melee execution looks like. And no, I'm not talking about the time you reused it and made it look like a knife stab. Move forward to trigger an in-game cutscene. This is an all-core class warship. Particularly this one will be a nuisance multiple times in the game. The reason for these showing up only in Serious Sam 3 is because they are used for destruction. Mental has given up on processing humans for his army, so instead, it's time for full elimination. This is just one of his many ways. In gameplay terms, the warship's purpose is to deploy more fighters. A single one is rumored to carry up to 20,000. These ships will also cause devastation to the ground below with free will, using its powerful laser and scorcher beams. They're able to travel at the speed of light due to their transdimensional jump technology, which is how it just appeared here in front of us. After attacking the building, presumably to wound our hero from the debris below that actually does nothing, it takes off as quickly as it came. The model just disappears though, which admittedly breaks the illusion somewhat. A horde of monsters spawns shortly after, although you can easily skip this part by breaking open a nearby wall with your sledgehammer. Outside this area is a dumpster that can be used to jump over a similar wall. In here exists the Secret Yard of Fame, featuring the names of many Serious Sam fans. I'm disappointed the Crow Team didn't actually do this. Furries are canon in Serious Sam. Well, should have known from playing The Dark Island. Oh. Hello, Zebby. Mr. Smith! Mr. Wesson! Glad you could make it. I've never seen a Smith and Wesson that looked like this before, but sure. In the pre-release builds of Sirius Sam 3, weapons had an animation dedicated to pulling them out of your inventory. I understand how this would restrict ease of weapon swapping, but it's unfortunate that these animations went completely unused. I feel they could have worked like those inspection animations in Sirius Sam 4, for the first time they've been picked up. Maybe someone could mod these back in if the files are still there. Anyways, this is the SOP38 semi-automatic pistol. Besides its black paint, it's largely the same as its Serious Sam 4 counterpart. The release of Fusion gave it a new firing sound. Here's a comparison. Introducing the Serious Sam 3 Kamikaze, sporting the same running animation as was used in Serious Sam Xbox, as well as the early Serious Sam HD trailers. In pre-release, these guys were far more pale for some reason. Beyond an upcoming hill, there's a lot more of them, which brings us into a familiar scenario. Ah, put a sock in it. Uh-oh. Oh, yourself! Uh-oh. Serious Sam 3 has quite a bit of nostalgia pandering. 
whether it be straight up reusing one-liners from older games, or giving you situations that are eerily similar to the classics. Hey, where are you going? Don't have a party without me. Hey, where are you going? Don't have a party without me. Ah, my old love. Ah, my old love. Ma'am, you're ugly. Ma'am, you're ugly. Uh, I need a vacation. Uh, I need a vacation. Who's next? Who's next? Thankfully, new lines exist outside of his dialogue with HQ, and they can be pretty funny. Yikes! There's an interesting comment in the making of video that demonstrates how enemies would be able to climb over obstacles if the player was out of reach. Cool idea, but never made it into the final game for some reason. If it did, I'd have been screwed here. But instead, I'll just listen to the hero theme on loop. These are gonna end up getting a lot more cynical, aren't they? While terrifying and risky, killing 20 clears with your sledgehammer is what's required to collect your Bone Crusher achievement. Outside of that, I really don't recommend you do this. Quinn, I've got a visual on the chopper. What's Alpha's status? I lost contact. In pieces. God damn it! Any survivors? Negative. And it's too hot out here to hang around. I'm heading inside to find Professor Stein. This didn't mean anything back in 2011, but now knowing this is where two of Sam's good pals met with a cruel fate, makes this presumably emotional scene feel dead. Pun very much intended. That one's for Jones, Bones. One can imagine the pain and anguish Sam feels inside, which sickens him to his core. Sam will now take out his anger through unnecessary uses of the word fuck. Oh, fuck! Need a rocket launcher right fucking now! All your base are belong to us, motherfucker! Wakey wakey, motherfucker! Fan fucking tastic! Motherfucker! Fuck, 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 fuck! At the time, cussing in a serious Sam game was pretty much unheard of. Granted, there is a lot going on here that should make Sam very upset. It makes more sense than ever for him to use adult language, but what shines more to me would be the intentions Crow Team had for Serious Sam at this point. They clearly wanted to shift out from the cartoony aesthetics to bring Sam into a more gritty and dramatic atmosphere. Dat Grass. Here's a stone tablet, of which many exist in this game. They consist of sacred carvings which Natrixa is able to translate. These are like Serious Sam 4's Radio Free Earth equivalent for Serious Sam 3. Oftentimes, the text written here is loosely related to the situation the player is faced in at the time. It's meant to be a little cryptic, but even once you have these figured out, the connection doesn't seem to contribute to anything meaningful. You can just avoid these, because to me, it's more like a reflection of Crow Team's fascination with philosophy. And in the case of this game, Danikin's theory. Helicopter hieroglyphs? We have helicopter hieroglyphs! Moving on. Here's a Natrixa pop-up message. Once these show, you can open the menu to get an elaborate debriefing of your mission. Occasionally, these will also contain details regarding the real-life locations that they were inspired by. While I recommend that you do it for the intrigue, you're never required to look at these messages as the game is remarkably linear. Any hints it provides you with are negligible. They're very neat to look through and help better immerse yourself with the game, so I'm gonna keep checking these out. In this message, you're being notified of how to locate Professor Stein, who was last seen researching some other stone tablets, which he was hoping could be somehow useful in the fight against Mental. After all, Egypt, aliens, conspiracies, that pretty much sums up the lore of this one. And we've pretty much summed up Summer in Cairo. Time to do a little research. During the game's loading screens, you'll find little did-you-know hints that'll inform you of some useful details regarding the game's mechanics. There's also some trivia, mostly related to situations in the game world. Like how 87.5% of people just stay still when seeing a projectile flying into their face. Did you stay still? If not, then the game is wrong. If yes, then the game is right. Unfortunately, in this case, both outcomes suck. Let there be light! Looks like I missed the party. Sam, I raised Stein. He's up on the second floor. Sounds like he found the hoopla! Sounds like he found the hoopla! Sounds like he found the hoopla! Hoopla! Sounds like he found the hieroglyphs he was looking for and got his photos. He's refusing to upload the photos remotely. Says we'll get the photos when we get him. 
Tell little Nelly to sit tight. Daddy's on the way. <clears throat> hmm, a no entry door. Well, I guess these can be trusted. Moving right along. Here's another stone tablet. The gods have perished and men built great temples on their graves. Only the oracle has remained. Aight. Now we're in the museum where Professor Stein should be. Head inside and, man, this looks pretty. The floating dust particles, the light reflections, the plants taking over where humans once inhabited, the cobwebs surrounding its corners. This might be the prettiest indoor environment Crow Team's ever designed. And where there are cobwebs, there are spiders. Crow Team introduces them with this alerting audio cue. Although the thing is so far away that the player will likely have no idea what's being shown here. I honestly didn't until a couple years ago where I realized, oh look, there's a spider crawling over there. At the same time, you'll hear helicopter blades. Who could that be? Is EDF sending backup? Well, take a look up to find that those damned techno polyps are back. They're the only polyp-like creature that makes a return from Sirius Sam 4. We're a ways away from being truly introduced to them in Sam 3, so let's move on. Shortly thereafter, we'll encounter one of these creatures, known as Antergion Spiders. These perform largely the same as their Sirius Sam 4 counterpart, however, are a completely different species. Rather than being pets from the planet Sirius, Antergion Spiders are from Antares Prime, a planet known for its gigantic organisms. While Sam 4's spiders are usually grounded, Sam 3's spiders will often climb, descend from, and stay idle on walls or rooftops using the adhesive surfaces on their feet. Be aware, as any location in the game could have a spider creeping up from any surface. These guys can bite you if they get too close. Their attacks are not terribly dangerous, but in numbers can take you down quite easily if unprepared. There exist glands in their tail region that produce poisonous acid, which will be produced, then hurled towards the player. It's easy to take down single units by performing a melee execution where the player stomps on its head, easily disposing of it. Don't melee while reloading unless you want to see another bug. You know, spider, bug. Actually, spiders are in fact not bugs. Specifically, they belong to a family known as the Arachnida, known for spiders, scorpions, mites, and ticks. This is an Antergion spider hatchling sack. Should you create any sounds above a certain decibel, they'll break open and the hatchling inside will begin its attack. Alternatively, you can shoot them yourselves for the same effect. Simply walking nearby won't break them open, although in some instances there are in-game triggers you can walk past which will set them free. Fun fact, these guys were once the only spiders in Sirius Sam 3, although they were much bigger and had a different texture. The Oracle said, Build me the tabernacle and I shall give you the power to wield the arrow. This tablet would mean nothing to the player until they've collected a certain artifact in the sixth chapter, so I guess this was meant for replayers? Oh snap, it's a juvenile Antergion spider. These guys have much stronger attacks than the hatchling counterpart. In concept art, it showed that these might have actually shot electric bolts at one point, although beyond this there's no proof of that. Anyways, perform this melee attack and Sam will skullfuck them to death. The sound made during this animation is actually reused for most of the other jibbings of enemy characters in the game. This wouldn't be a problem if there wasn't a loud thump towards the end of it, representing the spider's corpse falling to the ground. It kind of reminds me of the jibbing sound in Quake where at the end it almost sounds like the heavy from TF2 is making a loud gulping sound. No. Another no entry door. Okay, so I'll just pop in here and collect a secret double barreled coach gun. This weapon feels powerful but is less useful than its Sirius Sam 4 counterpart due to the slower reloading time. The only difference is Sam's endurance, I guess. The weapon itself is essentially the same. Kill some spiders for a bit until on the second floor you hear the screaming voice of Professor Stein and a lot of blood spatter. Oh dear. And thus Khufu took possession of the property of Horus which belonged to Osiris and gave oath to protect it forever. Oh, I get it, because Sam finds Stein's phone. Professor, you've got to get us that data. Quinn, it's me. Stein didn't make it. Shit. Did you find his phone? You mean the phone you just called? Uh, right. He should have pictures of hieroglyphs that haven't been deciphered on there. You've got to upload those to us right now. 
Then you can head to the emergency extraction point. Copy that. I'm not sure what those bit-crushed sounds were about, but alright. This is technically the first underground section in the game. While they say the first cut is the deepest, that isn't the case here. But this is a topic better discussed for Chapter 6. Sam will activate his flashlight underground, which gives the player less visibility than the otherwise natural lighting, but at least you can see something. I don't know. Still feel like there could have been a better way to do this. Hammer time! That one-liner will only activate with the use of this weapon. Weapon-specific one-liners? Now don't go spoiling me, Sam. Unlike later areas in the game, this underground location has illuminating green signs that indicate where the player should go to surface from the basement. For the most part, you can sprint through this area without much trouble. Uh-oh, it's a spooky. Whoa, mega spooky. I am now going to destroy this cabinet because I feel like it. Oh look, a secret entrance. Is this supposed to be a guilt trip? Ooh, what do we got here? An XL2 laser gun? Don't mind if I do. This is one of two secret weapons in the game which you will not find traditionally through the base campaign. Even the ammunition for it is only found by the means of exploring secret areas. Ammunition is very limited, so you should only use the thing when it feels necessary. The laser gun, as seen in every mainline Serious Sam game so far, is considered an experimental weapon. As such, the changes between Sam 4 and 3 make sense. Serious Sam 4s would increase in damage over time, but here the damage counts for one specific value. There's no weapon mods for it either, though the same can be said for every weapon in the game. That's an idea Crow Team didn't bother with yet, which for 2011 standards is pretty disappointing. This version of the laser gun's considered an improvement over the last one, I guess. Natrixa proudly states how it will not overheat due to the titanium build, which would be a good thing, if this were real life. The thing never exploded on me in Serious Sam 4, but I guess sacrifices must be made to make things more stable and safe. So here's the first variant of cloned soldiers in the game. These play much like the Octanians from Serious Sam 4, but are, of course, cloned soldiers. This one happens to carry a shotgun, and once you've killed it, you can pick it up. So this is where the player would first pick up this weapon had they not collected the secret in the first chapter. Clone soldiers are Mental's new attempt at weaponizing humans to fight in his army. This time, Mental has implanted humans with cybernetics, rather than being given large Wolverine-esque claws and an orange jumpsuit. Their LCU augmentations allow them to see from great distances as well as in the dark and fog. Despite this, you rarely come across clone soldiers in the dark. This may be the only time it happens. They'll carry either shotguns or assault rifles, which are the same types of weaponry used by the EDF. Sometimes when you kill these soldiers, they'll crawl around in pain for a bit before finally giving out. They're not a threat at this point, it's no more than a neat detail. You can easily dispatch a clone soldier by twisting their necks. It's a weak point for them due to the heat damage they suffered during mental cybernetic process. There are actually two forms of melee you can initiate on these guys, and it depends on which weapon you're holding during the execution. This is also the case for beheaded rocketeers. To perform a kick, the player needs to equip the pistol, shotgun, double shotgun, or devastator. Everything else performs the primary melee execution. I've questioned this setup in the past, and usually people say in response that they've attributed this to the shotguns. Well, what about the pistol then? Wouldn't it make more sense to attribute these executions to something like, I don't know, explosive weaponry? Rather than shotguns? One of which happens to be explosive? Kicking an enemy further away in order to blow them up moments later makes sense, doesn't it? The order in which they've chosen here still confuses me, and I think it'd take Crow Team themselves to help me understand what the idea was here. Anyways, you gotta make your way out of the basement while fighting countless spiders and cloned soldiers. Once you're out, feel free to explore a little and find secrets. Although, be sure not to jump off any platforms, because there's fall damage. Oh! Ma'am! You're ugly! Yeah, I'd be mad too if I had a lifeless face on my junk. The designer of this, and many other models, says the face on its crotch was initially higher up, but they decided to lower it in the end. Still no explanation for why it's there in the first place, but what do you know, the crotch face is actually a coincidence. If there's any moment in the game you could use to stretch the idea of no cover, all man, this is it. In this mini-arena, you're faced with the game's first boss, an adult arachnoid. 
Other than appearance, they're identical to their Sirius Sam 4 counterparts. Here you'll discover that these walls are completely destructible. Environmental destruction is something Sirius Sam 3 does really well, especially later into the game once you're out of the city streets. There's always going to be some sort of cover, but Crow Team did try their best to eliminate that cover while still being realistic to the gameplay. In this arena, the walls can easily be destroyed by the Arachnoid's machine gun arms. The only real cover here would be these pillars holding the walls together. Even then, it's not too reliable as its size just barely matches your own width. This undercode track, The Gladiator, almost perfectly fits with the firing rate of your double-barreled shotgun. I refuse to fire at any other time than when the guitar starts. One might wonder if this was intentional, although since it was only a secret weapon at this point, maybe not. Did you know that if you pirated Sirius Sam 3 back in the day, this miniature arachnoid, after a certain point, would show up in every level. It had full invulnerability and incredible speed. It'd then stalk and smack you as you played the level, which would more than likely cause the player to die. You must pay for your cyber crimes. Should you be ballsy enough you could activate cheats and put on god mode, even though that little bugger is going to be pretty annoying as you run through the game? And as if that wasn't annoying enough, Crow Team had a backup plan. Super Dizzy Spinny Mode activated! Eventually hackers did patch this out. You might wonder how I know all this, other than the fact that pretty much everyone already does. Well, I have first-hand experience because I didn't have a credit card in 2011 and I needed to get the game somehow. I remember Crow Team saying that Sirius Sam 4 would have an equally silly anti-piracy implementation, but I guess with the game being released simultaneously on GOG, the DRM-free platform, this would be pointless for the Steam release. Oh, that's got a sting. Take down the beast and well, now what? Ah, yes. Deus Ex Machina Ganars. When Serious Sam 3 launched on the Xbox 360, it came with a demo which was a variation of this chapter, Broken Wings. It features an earlier appearance from the Technopolyp, as well as a Scrapjack. What's interesting about this is that in the game's first teasers, these two enemies were in the level. However, in this full release, we encounter a Technopolyp later, and the Scrapjack doesn't show up until we've left the city ruins entirely. This is Bravo Delta Niner. I have visual on stone. Sam, too hot to pick you up here. See you at the extraction point. A very natural sounding conversation indeed. A very nice looking red barrel explosion. A very neat Natrix entry featuring the Mosque of Ibn Tulun, which is where Sam needs to be in order to be picked up by Garrett. This display accurately foreshadows the location that you'll find yourself at in just a few minutes. I don't think that's how you would spell that word, but nonetheless I'm sure Sam and whoever wrote this would get along just fine. There's an area up ahead with tons of Ganar, which makes a good time to mention the fusion bug where each time you prepare their melee kill, the Gunnar's eye darts up instead of looking directly at you. Everything in your current arsenal besides the single shotgun and pistol will be able to make a huge mess out of these guys. I'm pretty sure the intention behind this huge Gunnar fight is for things to get bloody, and boy is it satisfying. That wasn't satisfying. Oh dearie me, another adult arachnoid! So, a recurring theme with Sirius Sam 3 is that each boss character ends up becoming a regular threat. The reason these guys are so difficult the first time is usually due to the less than ideal environments they'll place you in. You'll also have a limited arsenal compared to what is typically a necessity for taking them down. Otherwise, in these more open environments, they're usually not too big of a problem. The collection of secret weapons can make these boss encounters far less stressful. I shouldn't have had the rocket launcher or laser gun during the last fight, but I did, and I could have used them, but for the sake of this video I'm keeping myself from using secret weapons during boss fights for the most part. There's actually a secret assault rifle in this level, but I forgot about it because I was distracted by some nearby cloned soldier. Here's where you can find it. Yeah, fuck you, chair! Oh, maybe Sam wouldn't get along with this guy after all. Hey, where are you going? Don't have a party without me! This doesn't seem like the type of one-liner you would say so triumphantly like that. In most cases where Sam 3 reuses classic one-liners, they fit better when written for the scenario. 
Funny thing about this scene is that if you rush over there fast enough, you can watch the arachnoid despawn and spawn back in. As I make my way through this suburban area with a critical point of view, I try to perceive the community backlash. These earlier stages of the game are a point of criticism, and the reason for that is usually due to the dull environment, as well as some rather slow pacing. What a lot of fans seem to be forgetting is that a good portion of the original first encounter was also slow. It's not that dissimilar from this. Don't mistake me for defending this part of the game, though. The emphasis on clone soldiers is to me a better representation of how this area falls flat. Serious Sam is known for a limited diversity that creates a sense of flow in its gameplay. When you're faced with almost exclusively one enemy type, it gets repetitive. The dull environment is by all means a valid criticism, and topped with the repetitivity of the ongoing fight, it's easy to see why a lot of people hate these parts. Well, we've made it into the mosque. Now it's time for some old-fashioned linear carnage. But first... I'm ahead of my game. Alright, if Serious Sam doesn't get a pass for shitty one-liners, don't give me one either. I deserve it. This is one of my favorite parts of the game. Using the sledgehammer against countless rocketeers is somehow endlessly satisfying. Each time I replay this part, despite how I should be over it by now, I still can't get enough. If you're one of those who hates this Serious Sam game, you gotta admit that the sledgehammer is epic, and its destructions are very satisfying. It may not be realistic, it may not be too detailed, but it feels damn good. Next up is a horde of kamikaze and clear. Much like the last hallway, I love this part too. Now, something that also gets criticized a lot in this game is the overwhelming dust and sand particles. I know I wouldn't be the voice of reason here by saying that there's nothing wrong with this, because many fans of the series whom I respect seem to dislike this mechanic. I'm one of those weird few who loves it, I guess? Much like the optional ADS and reloading. It adds a layer of depth to the shooting, particularly when you're up against kamikaze. You can hear them, of course, and with the use of stereo sound, it becomes a situation where your hearing is more important than your sight. The color of your crosshair also helps, but you won't be able to determine the distance as precisely as you otherwise could. Should a kamikaze charge me in the face, I'll consider it my own fault for not giving the other details, like surround sound, the attention it needed. Now, that's what I like to see. The unfiltered results of your successful carnage. Props to the soundtrack for making this all come together as nicely as it does. Damien is an underrated talent in the video game soundtrack industry. For Serious Sam 3, he has nailed the atmosphere of third world music. The flutes, drums, and various string instruments flow together perfectly. Beyond these tracks, there's also some excellent metal music. It's also the only Sam game with distinctively dynamic music that, rather than having a unique track based on a set level, has individual tracks that play once the player has entered a specific arena. It's excellent. That's a lot of bull. Realizing the irony and putting that clip immediately after talking about the music, I must assure you that this is a coincidence. Nonetheless, here's Serious Sam 3's introduction to the wearable. The most notable difference between Sam 3 and 4's wearable is that a very useful mechanic doesn't exist here. Headshots were a great addition to Serious Sam 4's gameplay, and it was particularly useful against these guys. Taking a single blast in the head from a double-barreled shotgun was enough to take one down easily. Alas, you'll have to resort to the typical means of shoot it until it's dead here, because there's no mechanic to be taken advantage of. Side note, Serious Sam 3 is a bug where the wearables will often stop dead in their tracks to turn around for no particular reason. They then go back to facing you again to perform their charge. Later into the game when they throw more of these guys at you, the fights suffer. Did you know that in an early interview with Devolver Digital, a representative suggests that a melee execution for wearables, even the kamikazes, had been planned? So you can pull a Nars eye out, you can twist a Scrapjack's head off, you'll actually be able to do a, something that we haven't shown yet, but to the headless kamikaze or the wearable. Things that just uh, makes it a little more interesting to take down mental swords. In the final game, there is no such thing. There's never been anything to prove these attacks existed outside of this comment, although a line of text found in the files of Serious Sam Fusion imply that at some point a melee for the kamikaze was considered for Serious Sam 4. Upon execution, you'd be rewarded with one of its bombs as a melee trophy. I speculate that this would turn into the beheaded bomber's throw. The idea may reflect an earlier concept for Serious Sam 3's melee, but that's up for debate. Grade A Alien Beef 
I love that one-liner. It isn't being overemphasized like a lot of the others. It's a more fun, casual remark. <laughs> Serious Sam 3 can do good original one-liners, which makes me sad that so many of the others are just reused. The delivery for this particular line was really good. It reminds me a lot of classic Sam. Grade A alien beef. There's some kind of parkour secret here that I've always found difficult to pull off. Not only that, but with all the enemy fire surrounding you, trying this just once could set you up with a broken secret because the platform is easily destructible. Should you actually succeed the secret, you'd be rewarded with some armor. <sighs> Maybe next time, parkour secret. It was here that I discovered, once you've deployed a kick on an enemy, their hitbox doesn't actually change. So you can shoot at the same height, despite they fall into the ground, and still inflict damage. <laughs> So I pulled out this guy's heart and... How did I miss that? Well, this really does nothing anyways, does it? And while we're on the subject of trophies again, sometimes when you let go, Sam's hand doesn't go back to its idle position. This can have some hilarious results. Also, the trophy jibs last significantly longer than corpses, so you can have fun kicking them around if you really want. LZ's clear. Let's get the hell out of here. 10-4. Ladies and gentlemen, Pro Team's most cinematic moment to date. Oh, aren't you adorable? Ladies and gentlemen, Serious Sam Fusion. Holy crap! You adore. Since we have an actual health bar to go by here, does throwing this melee trophy actually do any damage? Oh damn, no way! So in theory, I could take down one of these guys using just Gnar eyeballs? There's a challenge for someone to complete. Ugbot, I'm looking at you. So in this battle, you take down your first Biomechanoid Major. The fight is very intense, quickly forcing you into the middlemost part of the mosque in order to take cover from the Biomech. So, uh, some cover, mostly man? This all plays to what is basically the theme song of Serious Sam 3, Hero by Damien Marvunitz. Always felt the vocals to this song were a bit too grisly. We can sleep but the track itself is incredible. So incredible the Crow team would use it for way too many trailers forthcoming, even if they were unrelated to Serious Sam 3. Playing this next to Serious Sam HD footage just doesn't really work. Take down this beast, and you'll get a call from Quinn at HQ. Extraction has failed. Repeat, extraction has failed. The bird is down. God damn it. Okay, secure the crash site and save the pilot. Way ahead of you. Roger that. Keep me posted. This chapter feels like an extension of the last one. That said, it does have a couple new ideas. Early into the level, we encounter a cloned soldier wielding an M29 infantry assault rifle. Take him down to add this weapon to your arsenal. This weapon went through some funny changes in development. It seemed like Crow Team had no idea where the flashlight attachment should go. For the final release, they just stuck it on the bottom. Since the release of Fusion, Crow Team upped the clip size from 40 to 50 and gave it a new firing sound. Here's a comparison. Here's the first of several laser-activated turrets which litter this stage. The first instance here makes it seem friendly since it takes down dozens of cloned soldiers within seconds. However, if you walk far enough forward, you'll realize the turret is an equal opportunist. Sam will have to manually deactivate these turrets in order to get past them without taking heavy amounts of damage. The fusion build brought with it a longer duration between its laser making contact with you and firing. Even with this improvement, it's easy to make the mistake of getting in line with the laser and suffering the equivalent of a firing squad as a result. Just be sure to deactivate them with those switches, and you'll be fine. If you're having trouble finding them, follow the wires attached to the turrets. These will show you where to go. Okay! 
This change of blood color removes the enemy's specific jibs for some reason. The green blood textures aren't even applied properly, so they always cut off in a straight line. It looks pretty bad. Over here is a wall you can destroy with your sledgehammer. Past it's another laser gun, which counts as ammo if you've already collected it. I'm not really bothering to show off repeat secrets in this video. The reason I'm showing you this is because there's actually a much greater secret hidden within this secret. Climb these boxes, the air conditioner, then tightrope this electrical wire to get to a nearby rooftop with a C4 demolition charge on it. The C4 is far more useful in Sam 3 than 4. This game's environments are more linear and as a result, often tightly packed. Enemies more often cluster into groups, and this makes for a perfect situation to toss a C4. The one you find here as a secret within a secret is actually used for yet another secret. A few blocks down you can find this stash of garbage bags. Destroy it to reveal a C4 icon. Toss it there, move back, and detonate it to discover the secret rocket launcher. I know we've already collected this weapon, but it's a very intriguing secret and not only that, but is very useful in just a moment. Quinn, Chopper's recon. Garrett's gone. He made it out? Negative. Shit. Okay, well, we've been able to decipher the tablets Professor Stein was working on. It seems like- uh, Quinn, I'm gonna have to get back to you in a second. Sam, what's going on? Hey! Get the hell off my ride! I swear to God, I thought this was supposed to kill it! I guess I was just the original Serious Sam 3. Unfortunately, in Fusion, the Technopolyp has temporary invulnerability after the cutscene plays. You can kill it once it is taken to the skies, but if you do this, you'll have to face another one a couple minutes later, so as to keep the intended flow of the level. Otherwise, this battle would be far less intense. Remember, Technopolyps are hitscan enemies who will inflict damage on the player should they be within range. This is a common complaint regarding this enemy type. It feels unfair due to their presence being in the sky, which you're usually in exposure to. It's not too big of a problem if you take cover, but that goes against the game's marketing, and the chapter is called No Place to Hide. A good replacement would be for the Technopolyps to fire rockets instead, which is exactly what was done for Sirius Sam 4. This next area has countless laser-activated turrets, clone soldiers, and of course the Technopolyps stalking you from above. You'll have to carefully tiptoe around the suburbs in order to not activate nearby turrets. All the while, keep an eye out for those switches so as to deactivate them. This altogether makes for a stressful situation, and while I don't particularly care to revisit this part of the game, the first time you play through it is chaotic and exciting. Oh my god, the green jibs look horrible. What is this, a PS1 game? I guess nobody was really meant to play the game through with this setting, but man. I'm not entirely sure why, but in a few specific scenes with hatchling spiders crawling off buildings, their legs appear very tiny. This resolves itself once the scripted sequence ends. Spiders be slick. Oh, okay. There's a small area between buildings here where you can find a secret vest of armor, as well as this graffiti that says, I love you, Sam. Sam would love to know more about his secret admirer, but we have a mission to complete. Okay, time for us to take down the second Technopolyp. Unlike in Serious Sam 4, Technopolyps have a partial immunity to bullets. In the original release of Serious Sam 3, they had total immunity, which would force the player to use explosive weaponry in order to take it down. You'd also need to wait for them to start firing their own weapons, as this is the only time that a Technopolyp stays still. Firing rockets at a moving helicopter is, after all, difficult. Stone, do you copy? We were- Can it wait? I'm still working on securing that bird. Rocket launcher. But I thought- It's time to no talk. substitutes. Yeah, the secret rocket launcher kind of breaks this part of the game. You shouldn't usually be able to take down the Technopolyp until you've reached the final area, where you'd find a supply crate with infinite rocket ammunition. Man, those green jibs just look bad. I'm gonna have to change that back to red now. As I've just taken down both the Technopolyps, what's left for me to do is clear out the area while avoiding turrets. Make your way to the final area, and a level-ending cutscene will initiate. Come in, HQ. The bird is secured. I'm not even going to ask. Good call. But I need to bring you up to speed on what we've gotten out of the tablets Professor Stein was working on. They seem to indicate that there's a secret chamber inside the Great Pyramid. I want you to head that way. I'll get a chopper out to you. Forget it. 
There isn't a man alive that can fly a chopper in here and survive. Anyway, I can see it from here, and I always preferred the scenic route. What do you mean? There's aliens all over the place. It's... By this point, most people would be sick and tired of the city and ruins environment. Crow Team, realizing this after the launch of the game, changed the bright daylight to a darker sunset for the console releases exclusively. Thankfully, PC players did get to experience this eventually, albeit six years later, with the release of Fusion. It's only a cosmetic change, but helps to provide some variation which Serious Sam 3 desperately needed at this point. Though again, I don't feel like the city levels are inherently the problem, I think the real issue is how long they overstay their welcome for. They each range between 20 to 30 minutes. Each of these chapters serves a different purpose, whether to introduce a new mechanic or progress the storyline. The flaw here is that most, if not all of these things, could have been introduced in a single chapter rather than over the course of five. And here's how this one starts. Hey baby, was your daddy a pilot? Because you are really freaking ugly! I guess the daughters of pilots must be really freaking ugly. I don't make the rules. Harpies haven't been a very common type of enemy since the release of Serious Sam's classics. I wager the reason for that is because the way they've been programmed for their modern games make them frustrating to deal with. Should one get close, you'll need to take that shot. If not, or you don't inflict enough damage to kill it, they'll end up much further away from the player moments after. Now you're forced to use long-range weaponry. In the classics, harpies were much slower and didn't take off from the player's position. You could also easily take out individuals with shotguns. Additionally, they tended to group up because their wings weren't so freaking big. That would make them easy fodder for explosives. The design and mechanics of modern Serious Sam Harpies eliminates what made them a fun target in the older games. In technically Serious Sam 2 and up, I find the best way to take down Harpies is with automatic weaponry or a sniper rifle. Easy ladies, there's enough Sam for everyone. One detail I like about the new Harpies is their ability to sit and stare at the player from afar. They aren't alerted immediately as they've spotted you, instead they'll stalk, waiting for the perfect opportunity to make a jump on you. If you shoot first, then of course it'll come after you, at which point you've alerted the horde. Was that? Oh yeah, minor note, they share the same sounds as their Serious Sam 2 counterpart. Move up the road to find another turret. This is the only one that appears in the level and the switch is easy to locate. Past it is a bridge that Sam's gonna blow up in a cutscene using C4. Nothing says, honey I'm home, like a stick of dynamite. Sam will exclusively refer to C4 as dynamite in this game? Couldn't tell you why. Honey, I'm home! I believe this moment serves to imply that Sam is a chaotic character, and you should expect to see more of this kind of behavior in the future. Head up the destroyed bridge and you'll find the first non-secret double-barreled shotgun for pickup. Immediately after, you're faced with some Gnars and Clears. This battle perfectly demonstrates the weapon's purpose, because ultimately the best choice of takedown for both of these enemy types is the double-barreled shotgun. The player should quickly begin to understand this flow, and continue using the weapon in conjunction with these creatures. Oh shit, did I actually just kill that guy? Here's a hatchling arachnoid. Far less dangerous than the adult counterpart on their own, but they are deadly in numbers. Speaking of which, upcoming is a battle filled with hatchling arachnoids. They make easy pickings for the rocket launcher. Just be sure to rock it the hatchling of out launch hit the arachnoid. I found some secret cannonballs here, so surely there must be a secret cannon nearby. Green illuminating light? Bingo. This one requires a bit of parkour, but it's obvious enough to figure out. Jump on top of a car, use it to get to the side of a building, jump across some air conditioner units, and the cannon is yours. I still don't understand what the heck the physics are doing when you throw these trophies. Come get Sam! What remains of this level feels a lot more like Serious Sam to me. It tosses out the gimmicks of the last few and instead gives you the fast-paced firefights we've come to love from these games. You've got a decently sized arsenal now, so there's no reason for Crow Team to hold out here, and they didn't. This next area is chaotic as hell with powerful enemies and tons of ammunition to take care of them with. Lasers? Oh snap, the minor biomechanoids are here. They behave quite similarly to their Serious Sam 4 counterpart, though I have a different physical design. What appeared more like exposed brain matter has now been contained in a proper mechanical suit. They also have an actual face now, instead of one giant gaping hole for a mouth. 
have no fear being close to these minor biomechs, because they're unable to perform the kicking move that you're familiar with from Sirius M4. Which might I mention is an idea that also came from Sirius M's Alpha, at least if this sound file is anything to go by. One thing I feel compelled to mention is that in the Fusion release, on hard or higher difficulties, these minor biomechs have a variation of their traditional laser attack. They can spin around and shoot lasers in multiple directions, which is very difficult to avoid. Many other enemies have additional attacks. For example, the Clears can fire homing chain balls, Gunars have a fiery fist punch, the eventual Scrapjack can shoot ball-sized grenades in an arc. Even the Technopolyp wasn't left unaffected. They can perform a rare attack where they'll actually shoot rockets. Pretty much what they should have done from the beginning. I'm playing on normal mostly for the sake of this video, but I must admit a few of these new enemy tactics I find gimmicky. The Minor Biomech Spin and Scrapjack's Grenades are great ideas, but the homing chain balls and fiery Gnar Punch, they don't fit as well to me. But that's just an opinion. And so is that. Once you finish this fight, you can drop down here to... Wait a second. Jesus. Well, now you're in a more demolished area with dozens upon dozens of harpies tossing their electric attacks towards you. There are plenty of health and ammo pickups, implying a huge battle is about to begin. Not enough room in this town for both of us, partner. Once the Alcor class warship halts, it'll deploy teleport beams which more enemies will descend from while fighting. To damage the warship, fire your rocket launcher, or secret cannon if you feel like it, at those teleporter beams. Be sure to avoid its scorcher beams, as they will one-hit kill the player upon making contact. Once you've inflicted heavy damage to the warship, it'll think enough is enough, and warp the hell out of there. All your base are belong to us, motherfucker! Zero Wing is an existing video game in the Serious Sam universe. This is canon. Sam then calls HQ for the ending cutscene. You read me? Loud and clear. The scientists were able to decipher a map. Apparently, there's another Syrian chamber beneath the Great Pyramid. The map calls the pyramid the tomb that hides a tomb. Ah, mumbo jumbo, my favorite. So, I guess Sam shares my lack of interest in those stone tablets. There's no direct way in. The map just shows this isolated bubble. The words on it say, the Sphinx is the key. Whatever that means. I think it means the Sphinx is the key. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to blow up a big stone kitty. You'll just have to build me. Sam. Sam for three VR. Off to blow up a big stone kitty. Shit, this recording's an hour long. Oh, I remember why. The last 10 minutes are me trying to throw this clear's head into a helicopter. Sam, have you reached the Sphinx yet? I'm getting there. You solved that riddle yet? Because I have. It says victory is near. What's it say? Yay. I could introduce the sniper rifle, but you already know exactly what it does. I should, however, mention that it's specifically a secret weapon for the base Serious Sam 3 campaign. You won't traditionally find it otherwise. Anyways, here's Natrix's display of the Great Pyramid's secret chamber. It considers an entry point and visualizes the supposed interior which Sam will have to navigate through once he gets inside. If you open this game's editor, you'll find that the entry is inaccurate to the game's world. There are additional rooms mentioned that do not exist in the game. It's possible that the Natrixa entry was edited to be historically accurate, even though it has no correlation to what the player will end up exploring. The Silent Riddler marks the transition between the city and ruins to a more familiar Egyptian setting. A majority of what remains in Serious Sam 3 is set in these environments. The earlier part of the level is almost like a Serious Sam playground. There are countless different monsters in a rather open space. Followed by this would be the last couple city structures before truly immersing ourselves in ancient Egyptian culture. Hearing distant minor biomechs and clears headed your way while fighting off kamikazes is exciting and similarly terrifying. Feeling tense in this situation is what makes this combat satisfying to power through. Oh my god, did you see that over there? That would be what is called a sand whale. The sand whale was introduced as an ingenious way to keep the player from wandering off outside the boundaries of the game. Sand whales have short stubs on their backs, which are a form of sensitive cilia used to determine the presence of intruders from miles away. Should you find yourself off the playing space, you'll hear distant rumbling, which progressively gets louder as the screen begins to vibrate. 
The sand whale will then become visible, wiggling in and out of the ground before it makes its way over to swallow you whole. Don't bother to shoot it, as their thick scales are so tough that the only known way of penetrating it is via nuclear weaponry. With the devastating effects of such warfare, the military hasn't been able to safely eliminate the species. Therefore, sand whales are left to roam the deserts of Egypt. While a huge threat to mankind, these creatures aren't actually known to be carnivorous. They mostly feed on minerals and sediments. However, they're very territorial. Anything that steps foot on their turf becomes prey. So you best run back to where you came from, and fast. If you don't, you'll become a light snack. Sand whales don't serve mental. They're rumored to have been transferred over accidentally from a landing pad contamination when visiting a planet near the Gamma Pegasi constellation. In previous games, Crow Team prevented players from wandering off track by having them begin to inexplicably take damage. It never made that much sense. Introducing a lore-confirmed reason for Sirius Sam 3 was very clever. But you know what else is clever? Secret weapons. Here's a minigun you can find off to the right here just after exiting the mini-suburb area at the beginning. Intriguing to find two secret weapons so close to each other. Shit posting of the Egyptian kind. Man, I gotta get used to throwing these things while looking at the ground because that seems like the only way I'll make the target. Yeah, that seems to do it. Uh... You know, you really didn't have to destroy that box. Oh shit! Okay, I think I've got this down now, but I'm still not sure why you have to aim at their feet in order to align the throw. I was wondering where the silly secrets were in this game. I may have previously said Sirius Sam 4 was limited in its goofy secrets, but that game did at least thrice the silly secrets in this one. Hmm, a locked door. Well, violence has been my solution so far. Dear Diary, today, violence was not the solution. <laughs> Bitch. On the other side of this park exists a small building with a keycard. You can use it to open the aforementioned area. Pardon my trophy. Turns out this is just a resupply. In the middle of the park is your intended destination. Yeah, by the way, performing a melee attack is rather pointless if there are other enemies charging for you. You might end up dead. Serious Sam 4 would give the surrounding fight a temporary slowdown when performing these attacks. But in Serious Sam 3, you'll have to endure whatever suffering is going on around you. As such, melee becomes a death sentence later into this game. At this point, however, it's still somewhat useful. Everybody do the crab walk! I like how the upper half of Sam is just A-posing. This flashlight is foreshadowing something awful to come. But before any of that, let's enjoy a great alleyway fight. A little skull fucking. And then we find the Sphinx. Okay, Quinn. I've reached the Sphinx. Tell me you have this thing solved. Not just yet. We think we're close, though. Close don't do me much good. Sounds like it's time for Plan B. He's brave. Where'd you get the honey? Feel free to keep looking for answers. I'll keep looking for dynamite. A little carnage later and you'll come across an infinite cache of C4. Deploy these on the little red icons that surround the Sphinx. I think it's gonna take just a few more charges. Once you do, a cutscene initiates. Quinn, your egghead solved that riddle yet? Plan B is good to go. Just a few more minutes. Take your time. Time for Plan B. He's brave. Where'd you get the honey? I hate this channel. Ten sticks of C4. Four hundred dollars. Blowing up one of mankind's oldest artworks? Priceless. Hold, please. Man's gotta know when to screen his calls. You know, I think that guy should get his nose back. I don't know what I was expecting. This is where Serious Sam 3 falls. 
What can I really say about the tombs of Sirius Sam 3? Other than the fact that very few people like them. You get limited vision with your flashlight, you're meant to explore expansive areas with little distinction to keep the player informed, and if that's not enough, the game forces you to solve puzzles that in some cases make no sense. I only know what to do because I've played through the game so many times by now. When I was first getting familiar with the game, I kept resorting to trial and error. This first tomb isn't so bad, it's quite linear, and the puzzles do make sense. If this was the only one in the game, I'd totally understand and it wouldn't even bother me. It's awfully quiet down here. Nothing's tried to kill me in minutes. Creepy. Yeah, creepy the first time, boring every other time. Between one of these pillars exists a secret much like the earlier one from Chapter 2. Find a statue on the right side and a path can be found on the left side. Walk in to activate this spooky secret featuring a ghostly image of Jones. Research don't kill aliens. Big guns do. I'm not sure what kind of impact Crow Team was looking to make with these. Maybe the intention was as pointless as it seems. Anyways, enjoy your secret devastator. Here's the door where Sam will exit the tombs through. Hmm. Won't budge. Nearby is a mysterious room with a mummy known as the Oracle, the last Syrian. I took the effort of bringing it outside in the editor to get a closer look. It's a lot taller than the Syrians were familiar with as repurposed by Mental's army. It's possible that the Oracle was part of another species from Sirius, separated from the more familiar humanoids. This character is mentioned a lot in the stone tablets, but there's not really much to talk about. It's almost like opening the Bible and pointing to a random verse. You're probably not going to get too much out of that. All right, let's go. Let's see here. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, yeah, you could totally imagine that in Sirius Sam 3. Sometimes a man's got to accessorize. You pick up the Syrian bracelet here, which is a noteworthy addition to Sam's arsenal. It behaves as both a deadly tool, and a mechanism used for unlocking restricted Syrian areas. It's what's being referred to when the stone tablets mention the arrow. For the remainder of the game, the arrow is permanently visible as attached to Sam's left arm, ready to use whenever necessary. Would you look at that? It's cute and practical. With the use of his new Syrian bracelet, Sam is able to unlock the door. He heads upwards to find this. Whoa! Quinn, come in! Sam. I run around Egypt blowing up whatever you damn want. Quinn, no time for that. I'm in. I found it. The secret chamber. You won't believe it. And Natris has found something too. The data's headed your way. Let me know when you know what it means. All right. Have it sounds C4. significant. Try not to blow it up. I'll let you know when I have anything. Cute and practical. And deadly. So here we can demonstrate the power of your Syrian bracelet. It lets you group a maximum of five enemies together and tears them apart moments after. It'll overheat if you use it too frequently in a short time, which is indicated by a blue circle that forms surrounding a black circle in its center. If you pick up an enemy with the bracelet too late into its process, it'll cause a temporary stun on the enemy, but it will not be killed. You'll have to start the process over again, which is really no skin off your back. Natrixa doesn't have much to say about this bracelet since it was only just discovered as you picked it up. It has other uses which I'll show off when the time comes. While the bracelet is key to the game, like literally, it initially had a larger role in the game's development. An illustration in the art book can be used to visualize its purpose. Crow Team's idea was to have the player use this weapon to travel in time on the spot. There are a few existing screens showing off the alternate locations that were meant to be used when activating this bracelet. The game's final stage, Guardian of Time, was meant to take full advantage of this concept. Unfortunately, in the final game, all we've got is its deadly laser grip. If you want a thorough analysis of how this mechanic actually worked, check out the video Sirius Sam 3 History Switch on the Sirius Zone channel. Once you've left the Great Pyramid, you'll fight a crazy number of enemies. You've got the firepower for it, so go nuts. Going nuts is exactly what I like to do in Sirius Sam games, so thank you very much. Son of a bitch. Hell? Did you see that? I gotta stop pretending this eyeball's gonna help me. Oh god, we're bringing those back now. Uh, well, how about one of these? Where's your head at? No, seriously, I didn't see any brain matter in that explosion. What happened?
The eyeball is only worth one buck. Yeah, I missed. Uh, can I try that again? Wait, how is it over there now? Random fun fact, if you shoot the idle helicopter, it bleeds. Hellfire? Fancy meeting you here. The pleasure is all mine. Any news from HQ? They analyzed all that data you found. There are two massive power generators under Karnak and Luxor. It looks like they powered the time lock. Let me guess. They want me to turn them on. Oh, now you can turn things on? What the fuck did you just fucking say about me, you little bitch? I'll have you know I graduated top of my class in the Earth Defense Force. Oh jeez, what happened between Serious Sam 3 and Fusion to make textures load in so slowly? Let's try that again. Hey, after I clean up this mess, you, me, bottle of whiskey, couple rocket launchers, we'll make an evening out of it. Come on, Sam. You know I'm more of a minigun girl. Hellfire doesn't serve much of a role in this game, but I'll say one thing. Superior hair. Try not to get yourself blown up out there, tough guy. I'll do my best. Turn around to spot this one health vial, pick it up, and... <laughs> Ain't that Hellfire's voice? Uh, shit, where does this thing end up again? Ah, there you are. For this, you get a great reward. Kamikaze spam. Yeah, I'd be mad too if I couldn't see my own junk. Scrapjacks are pretty much identical to their Sirius Sam 4 counterparts. The best way to avoid their attacks is by moving between their rockets in the direction they're being shot. The only real difference here from 4 is their melee animation and trophy. Sam will pull at the Scrapjack's head, tear it off, and, uh, give it a little kiss. For whatever reason, in Fusion, there's a bug where the Scrapjack will actually A-pose before you melee it. Ah, uh, Fusion. Interestingly, Natrixa says the Scrapjack's three heads are selectable, chosen based on their situation to exhibit different behaviors. While true, the Scrapjack does go into its berserk mode after taking heavy fire, it doesn't rotate faces or anything. Maybe that was a scrapped idea. Get it? Scrapped? Eh, you don't know jack about a good joke. I'll stop. Sirius Sam has formulaic fights in small linear areas, as well as large open areas. Both should be approached differently. I've always thought the starting area for unearthing the sun has the perfect design for a large open area. It has a great sense of variation to the enemy spawns, but doesn't throw in too many different attacks to overwhelm the player. You have three main threats here slow hit scanners, rockets, and the explosions of kamikazes. All the while, use the appropriate firepower against them depending on the amount of damage that they can withstand. Scrapjacks aren't too fast, so you can take them out with rockets. All the debris surrounding you and the scrapjack will make that difficult, however, so you need to either break down those walls or navigate carefully around the environment until you've found a good spot to shoot him at. However, you're also being attacked by kamikazes, so making forward progression may not be a great idea. Far off in the distance, there's a Biomechanoid Major. This is the largest threat around the area. Your best bet may be to take it down slowly using the Assault Rifle, while also using this weapon to eliminate whatever enemies are getting too close to your position. You can also use it to destroy Scrapjack Rockets if you haven't taken them down yet. This arena is chaotic, yet still very manageable. I love it for that. After the first fight, you'll find the Devastator. Unlike Sirius Sam 4, it doesn't have a scope. Well, it might have a scope. That depends on whether or not you bought Sirius Sam 3's Gold Edition. It contained a scope for the Devastator, the game's soundtrack, a making of video, full box artwork, and multiplayer characters. One thing to note is that with the introduction of Sirius Sam Fusion, the Devastator will not have a scope regardless of whether you bought the Gold Edition or not. This is a Sirius Sam 3 vanilla experience only, I guess. The second fight in this chapter is much like the first one, although with a greater challenge as they introduce clears, more biomech majors, and a major arachnoid. With the Devastator in hand, you should be fine. But if not, then hey, you got the power of quick saving on your side. Unfortunately though, nothing can save you from the next underground complex. Not even the church. These are unholy places as defined by myself, because I have absolutely no sense of satisfaction once realizing the game is throwing another one of these at me. Quite the opposite. In case you're wondering, again like the game's city ruins, I don't really think that these are a bad idea on their own, but I do think the way that Crow Team did it was. Going down under to uncover some of Egypt's most well-kept secrets should be interesting and cool, but there's nothing fun about sprinting around a pitch-black environment the size of a mini-mall. You'd think this to be the caveat of a learning experience, but I'm not even learning anything. They could have done so much more with this, but instead it's as bad as it really could be. 
I mean, the only way I could think of making this worse is by removing the ability to sprint. Unless we forget that Serious Sam 3 actually slows down your sprinting speed indoors. Oi, I'm getting a headache. I mean, at least there ain't some kind of cave demon that jumps at you from the darkness. What the hell was that? Oh god. <gasps> Shit! Space monkey! Fucking cave demons that jump at you from the darkness. Just like mom used to say, the only good space monkey is a dead space monkey. It ain't just mom saying that. Hey, wait a minute. You know, studies show that games with monkeys in them are 30% more fun. Oh yeah? And what study was that exactly? So this is an Oregon cave demon. D Damon? Cave Damon? Forthcoming underground environments are littered with them. However, they're not exclusive to these places. Wherever pillars exist outside, they'll also be found most of the time. These guys really don't want to die. They'll almost be playing a game with you as you try to shoot them down, as they navigate around pillars to prevent your bullets from making contact. My method of dealing with cave demons is not dealing with cave demons. They'll live another day, even though you want them dead more than anything else in the game. Uh, was that? Oh, yeah, these guys use the same sounds as those lizards from Serious Sam 2. Also, in its concept art, it looked like a furry ganar. Once you've completed this underground puzzle, you'll make your way up this path to the surface. And good riddance. The next area is proof that cave demons aren't restricted to caves. If you still want to get rid of those pillars to prevent them from hiding away, well, here's where the Syrian Bracelet's abilities come into use. You can use this thing to break down the environment, one pillar at a time. If that sounds monotonous, it is by the way. How about I let you know that the dang thing breaks sight with its target should you walk around a little. Unless you want to be the prime course of pouncing cave demons, you gotta walk around. But if you walk around, you break sight of the pillar. So what do you do? I don't know, man, but I know what I'm gonna do. Move on and forget this ever happened. Wait, no, why are these guys allowed to break free? That's not fair. There's a few smaller arenas between here, and also the main focus of this chapter. This is a Syrian door, particularly the Horus Gate, which can only be unlocked by collecting four seals of the House of Life. Natrixa says the location of the seals is unknown, yet we then get an overhead view showing us exactly where to find them, which one would assume is what Natrixa is showing us. Behind that Syrian door should be the first plasma generator, one of two used to supposedly activate the time lock. So head out back and try to locate those seals. Basically, just look for temples, or structures with roofs. All the places with seals happen to have roofs. And pretty much nothing else has a roof. So if you see a roof, woof. All but one seal is protected by a gate which requires a keycard. You can find this keycard to the left once entering this area. It'll be in a small storage unit about a quarter mile away. No cover all man, am I right? Have a little C4! Have a little C4! I'm not sure what I'm looking at as I descend here. Are those a bunch of buildings off into the distance? What's their purpose? Why'd the Syrians do this? Is this all to power the generator which powers the time lock? Jeez, that's an awful lot of effort. You'd think the universe was at stake. Whoa. No, Sam, the bracelet's on your left hand. Oh, shit, okay, that worked anyways. Quinn! Horus is online and spitting out plasma like a... like a... That's amazing! We finally got an actual piece of Syrian tech running. I'm glad you're happy, but there's a bar stool out there with my name on it. And if I'm not mistaken, we got one more of these things to get running. Oh, right. Sorry. Get that spun up, and you can head for the showers. Copy that. Well, I guess we've reached the end of this level. Let's get back up and head on over to Luxor. Wait, what the? Oh my god, I'm gonna knoom. Not much to say about this guy that hasn't already been said in Serious Sam 4. What should be mentioned is that in the original release of Serious Sam 3, a Knoom could only be taken down with explosive weaponry, much like the Technopolyp. 
Also, since Egypt is full of pillars and those get in the way, Knooms will frequently destroy them in order to charge the player. Despite being a repurposed Hell Knight from a cancelled Doom project, these characters actually fit quite well into Serious Sam 3, and it's all in the title of this character because the Egyptian god Knoom is where this guy got his name from. Ants! <laughs> Ants! I'm not sure why I hit load just there. And stay down! After defeating your first Knoom, head into this small temple for. Oh no. Not again. It's almost as exhausting to write a script related to these underground segments as it is to play them. I only wonder if watching this part also applies. You know, I sometimes get comments on these videos where it's like, you're just complaining about everything, and I honestly think it's the tone of my voice that gives that away, but it is very hard to sound enthusiastic talking about things that you really have no fondness for. It's why I've decided to stop reviewing games that I don't like. And while I do like Serious Sam 3, there are parts of it that I really don't. I'd love to only talk about the stuff I enjoy from this game, but due to the nature of the project here, I've got to talk about these parts too. So, what can I say about this first part of the stage? Well, it was interesting to see minor biomix in the starting area here, since usually all you'd find in these areas are cave demons and clear. The puzzle here, though, is in my opinion one of the worst. You gotta run around rather aimlessly, again, finding switches behind doors that unlock once you've thrown other switches. Borderline monotony. Thankfully, after that puzzle, you find yourself outside to explore the temples of Karnak. There's a funny secret in this temple here where you can spawn big-headed parody models of the game's developers. This secret is a callback to a recurring secret in the classic games. Unfortunately, while these guys would introduce themselves to you in the classic games, in Serious Sam 3 they just waddle around. Don't you dare try to escape me, Alan Ladovac! You deserted Serious Sam 4! Get mutilated! Oh, this thing doesn't work on them? Uh, tickle tickle? Frick this. That feel when Google Stadia shuts down. So yeah, the Knoom is a regular enemy now. In the original release of Serious Sam 3, they would throw three arcing fireballs. Here, they just throw one unless you're playing on the hard difficulty. I really see no reason for this change. Without this attack, the Knooms are pretty much pathetic. Don't give it to me. I don't want it. Here's Serious Sam 3's most infamous character, the Witch Bride of Akrama. How lovely! In Serious Sam 4, we know these characters to teleport around an isolated area while hurling objects towards Sam, but that isn't the case here. First things first, they don't throw things at you in this game. Her methods are much less physical and more on the magical side, if you will. The witch will begin by charging her attack. If you're not sprinting while this occurs, she'll be able to pick you up, shake you around in the air, and meanwhile all nearby enemies get to take free shots at you. While this happens, your vision gets blurry and somewhat less saturated. Someone figure out if this attack gets Sam intoxicated because it sure looks and feels like it. As if this wasn't bad enough, the witch will inflict damage to the player all the while. So what happens if you are sprinting while she charges her attack? Sam will, rather than get picked up, be forced to move much slower while the witch inflicts that same damage output mentioned earlier. Depending on the player's situation, this attack can be even deadlier than the last. Instead of hovering in the air, Sam will be on the ground. It allows clears, kamikaze, and spiders to perform their close-ranged attacks. Better hope you got plenty of non-explosive ammunition ready. Lastly, should Sam be too far away from the witch while the attack is charging, he can completely break free before any damage is taken. However, this prevents the player from being able to inflict damage on them. The witch warps between our dimension and the shadow plane frequently. She cannot be harmed when materialized in that realm. Only when she takes a complete physical form can the player wound them. This will most notably be when they're interacting with you, whether during the attack or while charging the attack. Good luck trying to take her down after she's picked you up, because as she shakes you around, you're very limited in your ability to move the camera. Should you have your mouse set to a high sensitivity, you can bounce the mouse off your pad and back on again for limited success. As it sounds, this effort is usually futile. If you happen to inflict enough damage just before she charges the attack, she'll teleport away. Unfortunately, this only lets you do a limited amount of damage, but that could end up being just what you needed. Nobody likes the Witch Bride in this game. If this boss fight was the only occurrence of this character, then it'd be fine. Knowing she becomes a recurring enemy like the rest makes her presence in the game a miserable one. Like I always tell him, you can be as crazy as you want, but once you try to kill me, I'm gonna stop calling. The following couple of arenas are filled with beheaded rocketeers. 
A bad choice for the classic games, but a great choice in Serious Sam 3 because I love tearing these guys apart. Past this arena is the return of the turret. My diagnosis? Acute lead poisoning. And this turret makes for the first time that you'd traditionally pick up the minigun. Ah, my old love. You can dismount the turret earlier, but it'd be a waste of ammo. While mounted, the ammo capacity is unlimited, so just let it do its thing. I really love the scenario they've put you in here. It's creative and fun to watch. While it may seem like a good time to sit back and relax, the enemies will eventually overpower the turret if you're not fighting back. Once the battle is over, pick up the minigun and sprint forward to find the next horde of monsters. There's plenty of minigun ammo nearby, so don't fret if you're wasting a little between targets. I have enough lead for all of you. If you happen to come across a scrapjack, don't do this! The ending of Dark Bride puts Sam in a long, open corridor. If you're familiar with the classic games, you know what to expect here. Hordes upon hordes of different monsters coming in waves. Here's some cannonballs if you need them. You're about to encounter beheaded, scrapjacks, clears, wearables. Watch out for those wearables. They'll perform a tactic in this arena not seen anywhere else in the game. Take a look around and you'll find that instead of charging directly for you, they're circling the area. One by one, they'll eventually charge you, which at some point will likely catch the player off guard. This creates a great sense of variation to the usual firefight. In reality, it's more of a callback to a familiar scene in the first encounter's final stage. To win, just do the familiar shoot where they're going to be rather than where they are tactic. You know, it looks a bit strange when you detonate a C4 charge on the sand, and somehow remnants of bricks start flying into the air. Eh, whatever. As your guns run dry and the sky turns to gray, the hordes begin to slow down. Kill off the last clear. Damn! I'm better than good! And you're off to chapter 9. The chapter starts with an Atrixa message demonstrating where Sam might be able to find the second generator for the time lock. Just ahead, there's a small digging site leading to a locked door. The door will open once you've collected four more seals. Quite similar to Chapter 7, Unearthing the Sun. I don't mind this kind of repetitivity, as long as it's not underground. There's a storm going on which changes the look of the skybox, introduces thunder and lightning, and there are more dust particles than usual. In this area, there is a seemingly endless horde of monsters. They'll attack you while collecting those seals. Makes for some good old-fashioned, fast-paced combat, especially with the rather large arsenal you've collected at this point. Here is a good place to further demonstrate the game's destructible environments. If these walls were impenetrable, the fight wouldn't be too difficult. However, since just about everything in this area can be destroyed, it gets pretty chaotic. You aren't the only one ruining the place. In fact, it's usually the enemies who do that. So be aware of those surroundings because they might not be there for too long. I am Osiris. My word is truth. I came across the Sea of Stars to free you from your destruction... Uh... Delusion... Uh... Desti destitute... Des destitution... Remarkably satisfying. Oh, uh... After picking up one of these seals, the game will put you into an underground area, which is linear and will be over before you know it. Had the game made a habit of using these underground areas for non-intrusive situations, I'd have been all for them. Variation is nice, so long as it isn't largely distracting from the game's main appeal. Alright, let's go get this thing turned on. Come in, HQ. Anubis is online. Red plasma as far as the eye can see. Oh my god, the whole time lock is lit up. This gives us a fighting chance. Team Charlie is ready for insertion. And you're going home, soldier. Head outside for extraction. Thanks. I could use a hot meal and a beer. It's never that easy, is it? Want to know something bizarre? There are basic head models hovering above the two generators. The models are referred to in the editor as alien heads. Just in front of these are probe identities, which are hidden by a black box that are actually still visible in the game. I tried asking around about the significance of these heads, but didn't get any solid answers. Since the generators are referring to Horus and Anubis in their titles, I imagine these heads are meant to represent them. Horus is online and spitting out plasma like a... like a... That's amazing! 
Horus and Anubis are referred to in the stone tablets a couple times. Honestly, the way in which these connect to the plot can be cryptic, and I sometimes wonder if only a select few of them serve a purpose in the game's story. There was this one in The Silent Riddler which got me to think that Sam is a descendant of the Egyptian monarch Khufu. Then there's another in Unearthing the Sun that to my interpretation refers to Sam as Ra the Powerful. There's a reason I'm not talking much about the stone tablets in this video because I may end up completely misinterpreting them, as I probably already have. So with that said, let's move past this and continue. Make your way back up to find... Jesus, Harold Faltermeyer Christ! Hallelujah. What now? Well, gonna have to break open this wall with some C4. Have a little C4! Behind this are a bunch more walls, so grab a bunch more C4. Have a little C4! Have a little C4! With all those menacing sounds going on, you might want to toss a couple above for good measure. I like to think that there's another solution to getting past all this without C4, but Sam's just so pissed off that he's not getting his hot meal and a beer anytime soon. Have a little, 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 little C4! Find your way back up, to then find yourself back down again. Once down this pipe, you'll encounter a legendary hallway and a beast further ahead. Wakey, wakey, motherfucker! Ain't nothing says stopping power like a portable cannon. Ain't nothing says serious Sam Fusion like a portable cannon. This is the bug that irritates me the most in Fusion. What is a very noteworthy weapon in the Serious Sam arsenal is rendered half as useful because you can never shoot the thing at point blank. To perform a successful shot, usually the player will want to shoot this close so that they can collect enough enemies in front of them before letting go of the charge. Instead of lining up a good shot, you'll completely miss everyone! Maybe you'll get lucky and kill something off into the distance, though. So what's the reason for this bug? I reached out to a friend, Serious Sakor, who gave me a little insight. The bug's a result of a new aiming system that was designed for Serious Sam 4 back when that game was tied to its development branch. Serious Sam 4 is no longer tied to Fusion, so in reality they could just remove this system and everything would be hunky-dory. I guess the reason they're not doing that is because everyone might be frustrated that they're fixing one bug and not the multitude of others. Alas, at this point I think the community would be thrilled to see Crow Team do anything with Fusion these days, other than toss it up on new storefronts with a price tag. I doubt there will be a better time for me to show you this scrapped, weapon-specific melee kill that would allow Sam to toss out a Gunnar on a cannonball. I really can't imagine a scenario where this would prove useful, when a standard shot of the weapon should technically be more useful. I doubt this concept was actually animated in the editor without an inherent purpose. My speculation is that this was related to a cutscene, or maybe some kind of secret. Um, what the Gnar doing? Getting a little groovy with it, I guess. <coughs> Angry boy. Before you enter the next area, tiptoe along this wall to collect a set of keys. Backtrack to a gate that has a ladder inside. Climb the ladder to collect another secret sniper rifle. Now you can lay witness to all the stuff you missed earlier. Enjoy your sniper for what remains of the chapter, because after this one, you're back to the starters. Well, back to the front. There's a warship tearing up your area. Your extraction can't land now. Leave it to me. Sam, it's too big. You can't just- It's okay. We're old pals. This level has an awful lot of carnage, but you haven't seen a bit of it yet. Prepare to fight countless more hordes. This is getting too serious. So, that Alcor-class warship is back. This fight is pretty much identical to that which you encountered in Chapter 5 under the Iron Cloud. However, this time, it's personal. You've got much greater firepower than before, and the stress of not being able to get your hot meal and a beer. Attempting to flee once more, the warship tries to activate a teleportation, but fails miserably. The attempt leaves it in ruins as it plummets towards the planet's surface. Yeah, motherfucker, tell me how my planet tastes. On to the temples of not really. 
Just short of a year after the release of Serious Sam 3 came its DLC called Jewel of the Nile. This takes place between what are usually chapters 9 and 10. So for the real chapter 10, you gotta download the Jewel of the Nile DLC. This DLC contains three chapters, and this is the first one. Gathering of the Gods was actually the first map created for Serious Sam 3's development. It became more of a testing ground later on, which doomed it to be left out of the main campaign. With a little extra time, they found a way to implement it via this DLC pack. It begins with Sam and Wilson's helicopter on their way back home after a successful mission. Or so it seems. Oh, not so fast, Kimasabi. Unfortunately, the time lock didn't turn on because of a safety switch they recently discovered in file, which needs to be flipped in order to complete the process. Sorry, Sam. We need you to just finish this out. You're our only guy in the area right now. Where is this switch I'm supposed to flip exactly? We... You don't know, do you? We know what island it's on. Explore the island and you'll find a lot of locked gates. The game doesn't explain what you need to do from this point, but a bit of wandering around will eventually lead you to a universal key. I guess you could now open those sheds around and pick some supply if needed? The tricks has become sentient. One of the weapons you'll find is a fire axe, which is no more than a model swap of the sledgehammer. Anyways, picking up the key will give you access to Isis's tomb, which can be found to the bottom left side of the largest temple. Are you inside the temple yet? We don't have much time. Nice cans! Excuse me? Sam, it's too big! Pick up the Isis statue and put her on her pedestal, which is found in a temple in the centermost point of the island. When you do, you'll get a cutscene showing the location of another nearby. You'll then repeat this process four times until the cycle is complete. When Nefertari gave Ramses' his firstborn son Ammon her cop chef, the gods endowed the child with such strength of body and mind that no man has ever enjoyed. Yeah, I'd be mad too if I couldn't use my own junk. Oh, come on, that toss was anything but logical. The third statue in this chapter is notorious to first time players of this DLC. The other locations of the statues are relatively obvious, and this one may appear to be as well from the cutscene. However, after endlessly searching the temples, you're not going to find it. So where is the third statue? It's near the starting point of the chapter, and unlike the rest, it isn't actually found in a temple. Oh hey, water! First time seeing a body of enterable water in Sirius Sam 3. I wonder if I can make it over to that island over there. This is a very normal swimming animation. There is nothing wrong with it. This too. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about what happened to your friend there. Jesus! That's a lot of bull. Oh! Roughly 78.3% of the biomechanoid's body weight is the brain, yet its intellectual capacity is on the level of a cockroach. When you collect the final statue, a bunch of reptiloids spawn across the island. They only appear in this DLC and are separate from the rest of the campaign. My guess is that reptiloids don't prefer these dry environments and are better suited for more nature-fitted locations. You only come across them in these three island chapters. It would make sense. Regarding Serious Sam, the first encounters reptiloids, well, the majority of that game is dry but there's still plenty of water, so I guess they can comfortably roam around there at that point in the timeline? I've always felt like this part of the chapter spawns in far too many of these guys. It is very overwhelming, and you hardly have the weapons and ammunition to deal with them. Reptiloids may only shoot singular projectiles, but they do so very quickly. It creates an absolute shit show in the sky, so watch your back. I'm running out of ammo, so let's start using that bracelet. Whee! Oh god. There's actually two beheading animations you can perform in this game. The other with a knoom. It requires that you have two active players using the bracelet. I'll show it for demonstration purposes. What's happening, Sam? Come on, you're my eyes and ears here. Some kind of stone lozenge 
just rose up out of the floor. Quinn, what That's the- That's the seal of Isis. It should unlock the door to the next chamber. Another key? Did I mention how much I like keys? Where do I put this thing? I've uploaded the coordinates. Fantastic! You know me. If it floats, I'll make it work. This should help. What? Let's just call it my little secret. I think Crow Team took the criticisms of the game's lip-syncing too close to heart after the release of Serious Sam 3. Whoa! Oh, also here's the laser gun again. What's so special about it this time? Well, in this DLC you get access to the laser gun and sniper rifle traditionally, opposed to being secrets in the main campaign. After the DLC, you're back to the starting lineup again so you can kiss those goodbye. We've got two more chapters to go, so let's enjoy them while we can. You know, I find it a bit weird that Sam's finding laser guns in the Syrian areas, considering this was a man-made weapon. What are they doing here? Well, nothing left to do from this point. Let's move on to the next chapter of the DLC. Wouldn't you know, this was actually the second level made for Serious Sam 3. Okay, Sam, it's about to get a little hairy. Harry was my nickname in high school. You're not even going to ask. It's a great story. It involves goats. If I survive this, I'll force you to listen to it. Mm-mm. Never let him tell you that story. Ever. I'm noticing a recurring theme with the color in this DLC. Everything looks diarrhea brown. Couldn't have gone for something a bit more colorful? While fighting the first few hordes of mental, you might hear a distant kamikaze, which you just can't find. Head towards the start of the chapter and navigate to the buildings on the left. Break down this door with your axe to find an accurate representation of Danny S developing a serious Doom mod. Roughly 78.3% of the biomechanoid's body weight is the brain, yet its intellectual capability is on the level of a cockroach. Oh goody! A tourist attraction! One of this level's focuses is the military outpost. What's keeping you from going in would be the two turrets protecting the entrance. You need to enter the outpost to unlock the next area, which requires a C4 explosive. You'll find that here. So how do you get inside? Well, there's some broken wall to the right. You know, when you got giant monsters bearing rocket launchers, you'd think keeping two turrets at the front door is an oversight. Head in here, pick up some C4, deactivate those turrets, then head outside for some harpy hunting. Harpy hunting! Get it? Eh. Man, the sniper rifle makes dealing with harpies in this game far more manageable. Crow Team's message to the corporate world. Progress some more and experience some familiar Serious Sam carnage. I don't much care for the first level in this DLC because it all felt like a bit of a mess. This level and the following have some really good fights. Okay, that's all of them. Woo, that was a long one. Oh no. Please don't tell me they actually put underground puzzles in the DLC. Didn't Crow Team listen? It is sad for a father to bury his son, but even more so for a son to raise a hand against his father. Is this a cryptic way of telling us that we're wrong for criticizing the underground puzzles? Anyways, here, have some more underground puzzles. The deal is that there's another locked door with a pedestal and a statue in front of it. Next to the statue is a blank spot, where another should be placed. Sam needs to collect and place this other statue to open the door, hence it's Indiana Jones time. I would try to summarize what you're supposed to do in this puzzle, but honestly, to this day, I have a real hard time figuring it out. This one is very confusing, and as per usual, very dark. The whole time you're spent wondering why you'd give a barely visible first-person puzzle, no kind of distinction between areas? After dozens of minutes of fooling around, I'll find my way out somehow. Yeesh. You know, it just isn't a playthrough in Fusion until something starts teleporting into your face. And it ain't a party until the arachnoid spanks the space monkey. I think we've covered all the noticeable bugs in Fusion at this point, save for that glitch that prevents the dynamic music from being... dynamic. Hey Sikor, do you have an explanation for us? Ah yes. The familiar cutoff in Serious Sam Fusion, which also exists in Serious Sam 4, is based upon reloading a save. Croteam is actually aware of this bug, but perhaps we're unable to work a fix in it during the time constraints before Serious Sam 4's release. 
since then it might have been forgotten about. Seems to be something of an elusive coding issue if I had to guess. Thanks man. Say, how's that Serious Sam 4 video doing? s -Sakor? Well, anyways... Fuck this shit, I'm out. Head back to that temple with the pedestal to initiate a cutscene. Um... Come to Papa. Daddy's on the way. Once you're in the time lock control room, look for switches that you think might activate the time lock. Quinn, this doesn't look like a control room. It doesn't? Let me check the scans. Crap, you're right. This isn't it. But that carving bears the seal of Set. With any luck, it'll open the tomb of Sethar Kopchev. I owe you one, Sam. At this point, Quinn, you owe me several thousand. Something interesting about this set of DLC stages is their lack of infamous spawns like Witch Brides, Technopolyps, and hit-scanning cloned soldiers. It's like Crow Team wanted to make sure the things people hated from the released game were gone. Alas, that wouldn't explain the persisting underground puzzle and cave demons of Together Forever, which we also hated. Crow Team's a bit selective with community feedback. If they really liked an idea of theirs, they'll keep it around regardless. We're just lucky that a number of puzzles created for Serious Sam 4 were reconsidered for the Talus Principle. Regarding this chapter, it's the only one in the DLC that wasn't a recycled prototype. So I guess you can forgive the last chapter's puzzle as it was made prior to the criticisms. I feel this chapter deserves some credit for introducing the jetpack mechanic earlier than the final one. A little context for those of you who don't know, in the original game, the player would first use the jetpack on the very last fight. Many fans agree with this as a better way to have it introduced. Granted, to play this chapter in order, you'd have to stop a main campaign run to load Gathering of the Gods. Most players won't even know where this DLC takes place without prior knowledge. Oh well. Crow Team surely made this chapter for the fans, so we might as well appreciate it. This chapter starts underground, but seconds later you'll find yourself outside. If you've played the classic games before, you may see a pool of water and think, hmm, gotta be a secret in there. Well, yes, there is. Here's your minigun back. This level gives Serious Sam 3 a more tropical look, with loads of palm trees and areas that wouldn't be out of place in an oasis. I'm fairly certain the palm trees are meant to disguise reptiloids in the heat of battle. Palm trees tend to do that fairly well. The jetpack is introduced after locating a dam that Sam would have to either go under or over. And you guessed it, we're going over. It's impossible to climb these walls. Only way I can go from here is down. I've noticed a recurring situation. Sometimes when John Dick phones his lines in, it seems like he's rather distant from the microphone. As such, it can be a bit difficult to make out what he's saying in this DLC. Hey, at least I'm consistent. I'll give you that. At least the majority of his lines sound fine as is. Fly! Be free! So with the jetpack, you hold the jump button to ascend. There's a cooldown meter that you'll have to pay attention to. Should you fly for too long, you'll eventually descend, but slow enough so as to not take fall damage. This mechanic works well, and with a far less hectic environment to become familiar with it, this is the jetpack introduction we should have had all along. And the key card's connected to the red door. That's a pipe. Sam goes down the pipe, which places him into a small pool of water. There's something for the to-do list. A jetpack that doesn't short out when it gets wet. The corporations have brought the curse from the space. Ah uh, yes, the bovins in the sky. Next you'll kill some kamikaze, clear, wearable, and a biomech or two. This takes place in a long, linear area that I must say is a very simple yet effectively entertaining fight. Hey, I know we're on opposite sides of this thing, but I love how committed you guys are. I hope Sam never reaches that note again. Uh, more good fights up ahead, then you'll be heading underground again. Fret not, because this will only take a second. No puzzles here. Well, looks like something's happening. Just not around here. That's it! The time lock is online! Sam, this is huge! Well, I've been working out. Oh, this is huge. Oh, sure, yeah, this. I think at some point between the development of Serious Sam 3 and Jewel of the Nile, Crow Team's sense of humor hit rock bottom. Oh, mama's little oh my god, it's Big Chungus! Big, big Chungus, Big Chungus, Big Chungus! What Natrixa says about this creature is a bit odd. For a little context, recently I'd been playing through the first encounter again. You know, what canonically takes place after this game. 
You get a message from Natrix after killing a Highlander Reptiloid in Valley of the Kings. It reads, Bravo! You have killed that massive beast! I didn't know Illudrin Reptiloids could be of this size. That got me thinking, is that why there were no Highlander Reptiloids in Serious Sam 4? Because they were not yet known to exist. Ah, well there you go, the perfect excuse. But then you check the description for Raloom, the imposing prototype. He was created from sewn together parts of massive beasts. For example, Highlander Reptiloids. Hmm, so this is an inconsistency. One arm of Raloom is a huge SBC cannon, one of the original ones, now rarely used by Mental's forces. Even a single cannonball can tear a human to pieces. Can someone tell me why exactly Mental decided to stop using this? Did he want to stop winning, perhaps? To conquer Raloom, get up close to him and toss a C4 onto his belly. Have a little C4! These C4 make for the only reasonable method of hurting this boss. Encountering the beast at close range will get him to charge his giant hammer. You'll want to run away at this point because the impact of it hitting the ground has a lot of range and does great damage to the player if they're too close. <laughs> Blow up the C4, then repeat this process until a cutscene initiates, indicating that you've defeated Raloom. Now that the LZ is clear, Wilson flies in to take Sam back home. I'll give you one thing, Stone. You're a goddamn survivor. Aw, oh, shucks. Eat like snake, Sam. Eat like snake. Whoa! Jesus Christ, a little warning, maybe? Christ, Wilson, I think I killed half the known universe back there. Just be glad you're headed home. Team Charlie's just getting started. Ain't no such thing as a milk run out here. Whatever you say, man, this is nothing compared to- Waters! Was he going to say nothing compared to Tunguska? Because that would be accurate. Must be nitpick a clock because I'm being extra brutal right now. But nothing's more brutal than getting your vacation foiled once more after countless delays. Sam is now back on foot and with nothing but his Syrian bracelet. Well, you can pick up a double-barreled shotgun if you sprint somewhere off to the left. You're more likely, however, to first pick up this new sledgehammer, which works exactly the same as the last. Only difference is the retexture that tells you, yes, this is a new sledgehammer. Quinn! Come in! Fan-fucking-tastic! So, this error screen here makes sense. He took a pretty dramatic hit and rolled into the sand. That all must have ruined his earpiece. Now I'll have to find another one in order to contact HQ. The first half of this level is very tame. It consists of walking around an open desert setting. A linear path becomes obvious once the player progresses forward a little. It's a shame that this first half doesn't give you back your weapons earlier, because it had a lot of potential to be similar to a fan favorite level, Dunes, from the first encounter. Instead, you're fighting predictable enemy spawns, a spider horde followed by rocketeers, a scrapjack surrounded by kamikaze, and then a bunch of wearable. Not the most interesting fights. Rip Wilson. While I think this fight could have had more going on, I must admit that the Oasis environment looks beautiful. Serious Sam games should try more often to give its grounds more variation. Too often does this series rely on the same repetitive ground textures, but in this moment, you get to see the Crow team is capable of so much more. I always loved this part here. You go over the hill just to see incoming chaos in the distance. It's not much, but the idea is perfect, whether this was intentional or not. Been a while since I did this. Booyah, motherfucker! Who needs a vacation when you got a rocket launcher? Well, I'm glad to hear Sam isn't too salty about the multiple chopper incidents. But anyways, here's another chopper incident. The game reintroduces technopolyps here, which have a very limited presence in the game. Good thing, too, because without Serious Sam 4's homing rocket mod, Aiming manually is a chore. Still, I find it hard to complain considering how the original Serious Sam 3 build required explosives to take them down, rather than being suggested. Further up is a quite massive temple that'll require you to use all the skills you've learned thus far in the game. There are enemies of all types spawning in and around you. Man, you can hear just about everything out there. This Devastator should suit you well. Pick up all the weaponry you can find to survive including this secret cannon, unlocked by activating switch here, then shooting a crate up there. 
Handy for taking down a Kanoom shortly. Jeez, could that sun be any brighter? With such a clear picture, I want to get out the suntan lotion. The lens flare is so real, I have to squint. These jokes were brought to you by the First Encounters box. And yes, Serious Sam HD box, those were indeed funnier in 2001. I know what I must do. This was also funnier in the past. Have a little cookie for you. But at least this will always be just as unsatisfying as ever. The canyon fight ahead is very good. If you haven't been able to tell yet, I really love when Serious Sam games put you into a linear area with countless yet manageable hordes. Eat dust. Eat, 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 eat dust. Have a little sleep for and eat dust. Wait, didn't we already do this? Eat, eat, eat. Another one bites the dust. Crow team, you're killing me with these hilarious one-liners. Once you've taken care of the monsters, actually, even if you haven't, you can then walk through this temple entrance to trigger the next loading screen. On to the next chapter. Surely you're not the last man on Earth yet, but soon? Maybe so. Probably the last man underground, because nobody wants to be down here. The puzzle you solve is very similar to the rest before it. What's irritating to me this time is knowing that this puzzle really only exists because Crow Team wanted it to. There's no lore-defined reason for Sam to be underground right now. No secret chamber, no generator, nothing. Anyways, here's an actual part of this commercially released product. This isn't so bad, you're not meant to fall down here. Follow the path, then open a set of nearby doors, using the in-between stone walls as cover. And don't you dare say no, no cover, cover all man. man. There's one last puzzle that gets you to cross this rotating stone piece, which is actually pretty cool. Probably the only thing I ever liked about being underground in this game. Just after, Sam will make his way to the surface. He notices a deceased EDF soldier and takes his earpiece to contact HQ. Every time I see that animation of Sam leaning over, it looks like he's giving the guy a kiss. Aww. You know, I've always wondered if this is just a reused model of Rodriguez. What face can we find under the body? Oh. Never mind. HQ, do you read me? This is HQ. God damn fucking serious infusion slow ass texture loading speed. You know, I've had to reload pretty much every cutscene in this game so that it doesn't look stupid in the footage. Behold, as I now have the answer to why this happens so often in Fusion. By the words of Noam2000, it's a feature where, initially, the game loads tiny versions of the textures to speed up loading times and get you into the game quicker. Then, it actually starts loading the proper big textures asynchronously. It also helps with memory management, as these textures can get loaded and unloaded depending on whether they're in use. Thank you for the insight, Noam. Granted, if this is the consistent outcome, then I can't say I'm on board with this decision. This is HQ. Sam? Is that you? You're alive? Hellfire? What's going on over there? Sneak attack. They came out of nowhere. I mean, isn't that what mental forces always do? This should not be too big of a problem for the all and mighty Hellfire. In this scene, her presence plays more like a damsel in distress. Very unfitting for the character that they portrayed her as in the prequel. They're coming out of the goddamn walls! Quinn's dead! Charlie's team is out of commission! They're coming out of the goddamn walls. Quinn's dead. Seems like a rather inappropriate time to throw in a quote from aliens, don't you think? Coming out of the goddamn walls! Quinn's dead! And after all that Hellfire's been through, her fate is settled by the mouth of a single Gnar. <laughs> Shit! Hellfire! <laughs> Over? Oh, it's not over until I teabag every last one of you alien motherfuckers. Huh? He tries to moon me? I'll shoot his ass off and hang it on my wall. See you in 3000 BC, bitch. I'm heading for the time lock. So here's the legendary time lock. Hey, wait a second. Did Sam just say 3000 BC? BC, bitch? When you start a new game in First Encounter, it says 1378 BC. I asked a few people about this, and they each told me that Sam is just clueless and didn't really know what time he'd be sent to. As per why he says 3000 BC specifically, well, 
The only information I could find is that supposedly the Syrians first discovered Earth in 3000 BC. Sam must have just assumed that's around the window of time he'd be sent to. Sam is now en route to the mortuary temple of Queen Atshepsut at Deir Halbari. Out front is where he'll find the excavated time lock. At the end of this Natrixa message, we see a visualization of Team Charlie, as they were the ones chosen to enter the time lock once it's been activated. Unfortunately, if the earlier words of Hellfire are to be trusted, Team Charlie is quote-unquote out of commission. Who better to enter the time lock now than the one and only Sirius Sam Stone? After you've killed a hundred or so monsters outside, jump up this ruined wall and hop into this pit to recollect your laser gun for the final stretch of the game. And there's another secret inside a box above this temple. I must know the secret! <laughs> it's your sniper rifle. Oh, fuck! Crow Team knows. Take this! Uh, what about this? The truth is, I win, you lose. Then Osiris sailed out across the Sea of Stars, but he never returned. I guess nobody told Osiris he was playing the Dark Island? The last segment of this chapter has Sam hunting for gas cans surrounding a suburban area. Wheels, that should come in handy. Although Sam can carry multiple heavy weapons and ammunition at once, gas canisters are where he draws the line. You can only carry one at once, and each has so little gas inside that you'll need to escort eight of them. Still gonna need more ga 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 gas than that. Oh snap, another line of text to translate. Okay, let me just kill some clears here. Come on, you guys. No, I don't want to shoot monsters. I want to read. You know, I, I never thought about it, but yeah. Son of a bitch, Technopolyp. All right, let's just deal with this quick. If only they were always this easy to take down. Come on, gas it up. Still gonna need more ga 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 gas than that. A moment for the pretty couple here. You know, pathfinding was a big deal for Sirius Sam 3. With how often it utilizes destructible environments, this would have been a challenge to develop. The making of movie goes more into detail about how this was done. The system works quite well. Whenever I see gameplay of enemies getting stuck like this, it's a result of playing in the fusion build. This is a familiar bug now, which I honestly don't recall from the vanilla game. I could be wrong though, it's been at least four years since I played it that way. Hopefully, with the limited gas he's collected, Sam can make his way to the Temple of Achepsit, then jump right into that time lock. That should do it. Sam for 3 VR. I'm a lot of things, fella, but I am not your lunch. Notice how everything looks a lot more noir. This chapter seems to have a forced graphics filter. You can lessen it by setting the color options to saturated if you want. Once you've escaped the sand whale, you'll begin fighting countless hordes of Mental's army. From a near endless fight with beheaded rocketeers, we do consider attacking one at a time, to an ensemble of kamikaze. What are you screaming for? The pain hasn't even started yet. What are you screaming for? The paint hasn't even started yet. I've just noticed there's no clone soldiers or Gnars in this chapter, are there? There's Clears, Biomechs, even the rare Technopolyp. This same area where you'll encounter them will have a couple of Witch Brides. I ran past this fight, but then triggered a horde of arachnoid hatchlings, which pushed me back. Fighting against multiple Witch Brides is time consuming, but the good news is you probably won't be taking too much damage from them alone. Throw the hatchlings in there and, uh,. As you navigate through the canyons, you'll encounter much beefier foes. There's a whole bunch of Knoom at one point. The first time I played this game in 2011, I found that very intimidating. At one point, you'll be up against hundreds of spiders, and a lot of people think this part sucks because it's just a bunch of slow-moving spiders. I guess I'm the only one who enjoys blowing these things up. This area here was my first hands-on experience with Sirius Sam 3, more or less. My pirated copy wouldn't let me play past a certain point because of funny Spider-Man. All I had left to enjoy was the survival mode, which spoiled me on the weapons and monsters. What can I say? I was desperate to play this game and I didn't have a credit card. Kinda interesting fun fact. Halfway up this point exists a 200 Super Armor pickup, which was a scrapped item in Serious Sam 3 Vanilla. They brought it back here for a one-time use infusion. 
I probably don't need to elaborate on the fact that it gives you 200 units of armor. Oh, hello Sandy. So after more than half an hour of non-stop shooting, Sam realizes just how silly his earlier comment was in Temples of Nubia. Jesus Christ, Wilson, I think I killed half the known universe back there. Completely worn out, Sam hopes for a break. He gets one, but only as Ugzon the Fourth ascends from underneath the sand. Oh, fuck. However, even the vicious warlock isn't safe from the endless garbage disposal that is the Sand Whale. Are you guys having an ugly contest? I'll make it easy for you. You both win. Despite looking like some kind of giant spider, this Ugzon is not much different from its other bipedal iterations. The four legs you see were biomechanically grown to replace its two legs that were lost in the great battle for Alpha Centauri. Ugzon IV has two natural arms and two artificial ones. As Natrixa writes, there seems to be a particular affection to having four arms in the Ugzon dynasty. Someone ought to tell that to Ugzon VI. Natrixa says this guy has thick skin all around its body with the exception of its back. This wasn't a priority in his design because he is very quickly able to spin his body around to face the opposition. You shouldn't be able to reach his weak points so easily. That's when the not-so-friendly Sand Whale comes to our rescue. Are you guys having an ugly contest? So, for that scene you saw earlier, I had to boot up the original build of the game because for some reason while using Fusion, this happens. I'm not sure if this is a well-documented bug or not, but it's the first time I've seen it. Anyways, this is where you use that jetpack for the first time in the standalone campaign. <laughs> Who needs choppers? First things first, explore the area a bit, but be careful not to run too close into the surrounding hordes targeting you. There's Technopolyps here, and a hitscan enemy seems like a terrible choice for this fight. Crow Team agrees. That's why for this one battle, the hitscanning bullets have been replaced with rocket projectiles. You'll soon notice a pile of glowing sticks that your curiosity will have you fly towards. Unconventional, but you'll do. These giant rods can be picked up and thrown into Ugzon's back while he's being attacked by the Sand Whale. With the rods thrown into its back, a strike of lightning will eventually hit him, which temporarily stuns the beast. In this vulnerable state, the player can inflict a serious amount of damage to Ugzon, preferably using your cannon. Repeat this process enough times to trigger the final cutscene. And that's how we do it on planet Earth, you overgrown space cockroach. Sam takes off from here, and his shoes probably didn't survive the heat damage from his jetpack. Eh, it's the best explanation I can get for why he's wearing red sneakers from this point forward. The time lock is waiting, but Sam feels it's appropriate to make one last call before he travels to a time where cell service doesn't exist. Hey, is your dad home? Judy Mental, huh? This is Mental's supposed daughter? I have a couple questions. Firstly, if Mental is Mr. Mental, then where's Mrs. Mental? Secondly, the lore states that Mental was the name humanity gave to Taum. So, why does his daughter refer to herself this way? Thirdly, for the serious tone this game was portraying, doesn't this feel a little bit Serious Sam 2 to you? Whatever, it is what it is, because after all... Tell him Sam's coming over to play, and by play, I mean kill him. Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I am. My, huh? I gotta get to that time lock right now. I'll see you in 3000 BC, Mental. You motherfucker! Ah! God, I love this scene. So, what just happened here? Well, Mental decided humankind is not worth the trouble and launches the moon towards the planet because enough is enough. Sam manages to enter the time lock just fast enough to evade the planet's end. Now, it's interesting to ponder if Sam never actually wins the battle. We don't know yet because past the Serious Sam classics we haven't had a proper continuation, but if he were to win, then this shouldn't be the outcome, right? Time should have adjusted to Sam's victory as seen when he enters the time lock. Right? Nonetheless, during the time period where Sam is sent, Mental and his hordes are currently ongoing the attack of the Syrians before causing their extinction. The Time Lock's activation in 1378 BC on Earth causes a shockwave across the universe that alerts Mental during his pursuit. As a measure of caution, Mental decides to send Ugzon III and a legion of monsters to patrol and investigate the planet just in case. 
With the assistance of Natrix's intelligent database, Sam Stone will now explore the scorching hot temples of ancient Egypt in order to find the SSS Center Price in Sirius Sam, The First Encounter. The first thing I'd like to say regarding Sirius Sam 3 is related to its connections between the previous game and its timeline. Sirius Sam 4 had very strong relations to its characters, which is not at all the case in Sirius Sam 3. I would say the strongest connection there is in the game is between Sam and Quinn, who actually didn't interact that much in Sirius Sam 4. Regarding how close everyone was in the last game, it feels odd that they've been largely separated here. For continuity's sake, it is a bit strange. This, and Sirius Sam's clothes randomly changing in first encounter, makes me wonder if these events are being told through different timelines. In saying that, I suggest that the stories would be largely the same regardless. Minor changes like character personalities and aesthetic inconsistencies would be appropriate. The idea is that regardless of the timeline told, the story will never be profoundly different. The average player would probably come to a more rational conclusion, being that Crow Team's preferences have changed over the years. A lore dissector may suggest the timeline theory presented in Sirius Sam 4, which opened the story to near-infinite possibilities. I think the real answer is somewhere in between. Crow Team's preferences have indeed changed, much like the company as a whole. With a lot of new creative juices flowing, I'm guessing not everyone's on board with plans that were written 20 years ago by different people. Much like the fanbase is divided on what they want Serious Sam to be, I think Crow Team is equally divided on what they want Serious Sam to be. So with infinite timelines, Serious Sam can be whatever the heck Crow Team feels like at any given time. Still, they can't keep delegitimizing their story, so I think comparing Serious Sam 3's with 4's is still valid. Another point to be made is regarding the absence of important characters like Professor Kiesel and Carter. As per Kiesel, the best explanation for this that I can come up with is that he was tasked for different operations during this mission. That would make sense. Hell, I could buy it for Carter as well. It's just a bit odd how they're not even given a mention. Safe to say, the plans for Serious Sam 4 must have changed a lot between the release of Sam 3 and the game actually coming out. That's especially true when you consider the love and heart put into everything else unrelated to its story or characters. True, Sam 3's modern style wasn't appreciated by all, however when you take a keen eye to the little details and structure behind the game, it fits together and for the most part makes sense, even if you don't like it. This isn't me trying to spit in the direction of Sam 4, it's just that that game had too many ideas implemented without rhyme or reason. In Serious Sam 3, we start in a ruined Egyptian city because it's the modern day apocalypse that takes place before Sam jumps into the time lock. Reloading for more weapons is meant to give the earlier combat a more hectic feel. And while we're on this subject, let me say the contrary to popular belief, I don't think having weapons that reload were a bad idea. Surely if Sam was running around with endless shotgun and assault rifle clips, these chapters would be far too easy. Note how the further you get into the game, you're not likely to use these starter weapons anymore. The remaining weapons don't have that function, save for the Devastator, which is another that brings the same issue to light. If Sam could fire that thing non-stop, it would break the flow of the game. The classic Sam games didn't have this problem as much because they would very quickly put the player in dangerous situations where absurd firepower is necessary. A lot of people have said the classic games are unfair, and to that my answer is, you have the firepower you need, you don't have to reload, so get over it. Once you've finished the first five chapters of Serious Sam 3's main campaign, admittedly a long stretch, the classic routes become much clearer. Large enemies threaten you from a distance while weaker foes bombard you from the front. Hordes become exponentially larger in numbers than before. Gore is plenty and usually stays until you've looked away from it. Plenty of secret weapons can be found for experienced players running on higher difficulties. The soundtrack has a familiar focus on drum beats. Linear battles begin to have much wider spaces for the opposition to easily flank you. You know, it's all the things that Serious Sam 4 had difficulties with. Well, I guess that game was larger in numbers, but contrary to popular belief, that alone doesn't define the combat in this series. There are a couple things that Serious Sam 3 does not pull off when it comes to embracing the classic roots. For one thing, the silliness factor barely exists. But for all intents and purposes, that was a part of its design. Sure, I can be disappointed that the goofy secrets are at an all-time low, and a lot of Sam's original quips were reused from the classics. That's a lot of bull. Now that's a lot of bull. What I found most disappointing, though, was the tone. Even though that is another thing I will admit makes sense in the context of the game. Sam's friends have mostly died at the hands of Mental's Horde, and not to mention how pathetic these deaths were considering their legacies. He's pissed off and has no time for fun and games. This time it really is serious, and I get that. I can't even critique this much because in all honesty, if Sam was still cracking witty one-liners with a smirk on his face, I'd consider him a sociopath at this point. Didn't stop him from behaving that way in the Jewel of the Nile DLC, but I guess Crow Team was responding to that criticism. 
Where a Serious Sam game matters most is in its gameplay. While the pacing for the first half of the game is agreeably slow, the gunplay is solid. This becomes more apparent the further you go, allowing you to get a better feel for how powerful this arsenal is. And the gore, my god the gore. It may not be totally realistic, but the feeling you get after creating an absolute mess of the weaker foes, it's exhilarating. Special thanks goes out to Damien's incredible soundtrack, with the fast-paced intensity of those drums keeping my adrenaline flowing as I take down each enemy one by one. It may not be the cinematic Oscar bait that Serious Sam 4 seemed to go for, but frankly, I'd prefer a Serious Sam soundtrack to fit its trademark style instead of winning over a fancier audience. Beyond its weapons, the way fights were designed in some areas of the game is absolutely phenomenal. There are many great linear fights, and even some great exposed fights. The first couple minutes of Unearthing the Sun is a stellar example of what Serious Sam 4's combat should have looked like. I'm giving this game a lot of praise right now, and yeah, it's hard not to do that after making a two and a half hour long video about Serious Sam 4. However, this would not be a fair assessment if I were to ignore the many things that Serious Sam 3 did wrong. The story, should you want to follow the actual going-ons, feels confusingly sewn together. Despite it being rather important for the game, it seemed to be pushed to one side, while giving the remainder a center focus. And I'm absolutely on the side of thinking this was a better choice than to give the story a larger priority. There's a lot of detail here, but instead of laying it out in a clear, simple fashion, it's muddied across the Natrixa board and very basic comments from Quinn at HQ. The game does have world building, examples being the various propaganda posters, and graffiti writings that Natrixa translates for you. I'm sure there could have been some unique ways to implement the story without resorting to these cryptic stone tablets that the player would have to stop and think about in order to get any real insight. When it came to me unraveling the game's story, I had to cross-reference the wikia for much of the information. But then I had to contact a few noteworthy people in the community to make sure that that was even correct, because a lot of it isn't. The underground puzzles are a chore, and by now I don't have to keep repeating that because I must sound like a broken record at this point. With better lighting, more distinct environments, and more variation on the actual puzzles, it could have done the game wonders. I don't even think the cave demons were inherently a bad idea. It's just the way they were handled that was. You know, they blend in too easily to the darkness, and their movement patterns do not make them fun to track down and eliminate. But at this point, much like the underground tombs, they're perhaps best left in the past. The same can be said for these variants of certain monsters like the Technopolyps and Witchbrides, and I mean specifically Serious Sam 3's iterations. The mechanics they use in this game ruin the flow of the gameplay. There is a very small window of time for the player to escape or even prevent the attack of a witch bride, so when they're around you feel as if you need to hide somewhere. However, hiding isn't going to get rid of the creature. For a series based on formulaic action, it's weird that there aren't any notable tactics for dealing with this secret bitch. With the exception of your cannon. It does one-shot them with a full charge, but for many instances where there's one around, you don't have that weapon yet. Technopolyps are somewhat more manageable. You know when they're going to attack, it's when they stay still. That's also the only time you can accurately aim at them. Far as I can tell, there's no way to attack a Technopolyp this way without taking damage. So unless you're incredibly skilled at anticipating flight patterns with projectile speed, in other words, an expert, you're probably going to hate these guys. The idea is to design the game in a way that is fun without being too frustrating, and unfortunately those two foes better fit into the latter category. Thankfully, beyond these, and I suppose cave demons, the enemies are manageable. Yes, even the hit-scanning soldiers. Last thing I wanted to point out was how much I love these games taking place in Egypt, or at least foreign places that I could only hope to visit. They're especially fascinating if deserted. I don't know if it's just me, but if I've got NPCs following me around, I tend to feel like I need to get a move on. If not, doesn't that break your immersion? You really think these guys are just gonna sit around and wait for me while I skip around the place like a jackass? Now, I'm not trying to point the blame at games that do this, they all have their own unique ways of making the player feel immersed. In Serious Sam, what immerses me the most is my sheer focus on the formulaic combat and mysterious environments that embrace my sense of curiosity. Egypt, especially with the mythological alien interventions, makes for a great setting, and I for one don't care if they gotta revisit it every couple games. Man, I hope they never send me back to Egypt. Though I think Crow Team has since given up on it. I may not be the biggest fan of Second Encounter, though my reasons for that are separate from it taking place in South America. These environments were great for a Serious Sam game. There are countless more interesting places on the Earth that Sam could visit, although with the direction Serious Sam 4 took, I'm not sure if Crow Team could ever again pull off the feeling of mystery that you had with the classics and Serious Sam 3. The best case scenario I can think of with the new approach is if interstellar travel was introduced. A game taking place entirely on Venus would be neat. Or maybe the moons of Saturn? Why keep it limited to only our solar system? 
But I don't see any of this happening because after all, you can't photo scan it. Can you tell I'm still a little frustrated about how Serious Sam 4 turned out? Whatever. What I do know is that Serious Sam 3 is not as good or bad as people say. It seems like you either love or hate this game, so I'm one of those strange in-the-middle guys. It is not without glaring flaws and noteworthy strengths. Do I recommend the game? Well, yeah. At the very least, it's worth one playthrough. As many have said by this point, you may get bored with the ruined city streets, but there is more to this game than that, and hopefully you've come to understand that perspective a little more after this feature video.